OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Half past seven this Wednesday morning. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10. We'd love to hear from you. 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number, and that's the number you're going to need to enter our expert electrical competition a little bit later on. We'll be playing the mystery voice for you three times across the show, so make sure you stay tuned for that. We've got a 200 euro voucher for expert.ie, their uh, shiny new website which is uh, going to sort you out just in time for Christmas. So um, we'll give you the opportunity. First one around about a quarter past eight this morning. In the meantime, I'll tell you what's coming up. Andy Moran's going to join us a little bit later on. We have a brilliant piece where Jason McAteer and Mark Lawrence uh, quiz each other on each other's careers and see how much they actually know about each other. And we're going to talk about Ireland against Finland with Irish international Anjo Gorman. That's coming up a little bit later on. Nathan's going to join us as well. We'll talk about Stephen Kenny's uh, so far fruitless hunt for goals and a win. Fingers crossed that's all going to change tonight. First, though, here's writer Jeff Perlman on his book, Three Ring Circus. It's another incredible work focused on the relationship between Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant and Phil Jackson in their L.A. Lakers era. Have a look. You know, Phil Jackson arrives and they throw, you know, $30 million contract at him. And it seems Kobe and Shaq definitely want Jackson to arrive and Tex Winter as well. And, and thankfully, we have the last dance as a nice reference point here. So when I say triangle offense, everybody kind of knows what it means now. But yeah. that's about... Uh, teamwork that's about Jordan passing the ball more based on what you're saying it doesn't sound like Kobe ever wilted all that much or became a selfless player which begs the question uh, did they reach the heights they should have reached acknowledging they won three titles I think they did I mean it's hard I mean not that many teams win back to back to back NBA titles right and on the one hand it's interesting was the last dance very popular in Ireland like in your oh. circles Find me somewhere where it's not very popular. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good. Um, it had some holes, but I thought it was really, really good. Like, really, really good and enjoyable. And reminded me how great Jordan was, which I really liked, actually. Um, the thing about the triangle in Chicago, the biggest difference, I think, is um, in Chicago, the pecking order was very clear, right? Phil Jackson's a coach. Michael Jordan's the best player. Scottie Pippen is not trying to be Michael Jordan. There's not one moment in the last dance where Scottie Pippen says, I was better than Jordan, ever. There was no hint of it. And then Tony Kukoc was never trying to out be better than Pippen. Like, it's not, there's a very clear order. And Dennis Rodman was just there to rebound. So he never cared about scoring. When Phil Jackson shows up in LA, it's much more confusing because you have two guys who want to be Jordan, two guys who think they should be carrying the offense. So it was a much harder, I think, and in a way more impressive coaching job that Phil Jackson did in LA because he had to deal with these two massive egos who both thought they were number one. The triangle was never as good in LA, I don't think, as it was in Chicago for that reason. And because Kobe, the thing Kobe would do that used to drive teammates crazy, they would play a team where they had a superstar. Like they would play Vince Carter on the Toronto Raptors or they play Iverson in Philly. And Kobe in his mind would get it where I have to outdo that guy. And it became this one-on-one -on -one battle. And the other Lakers would be really, they knew heading into Toronto, this was going to suck. This would not be a fun game. Because Kobe would want to take it at Vince Carter every time. So it was a lot of Phil having to take Kobe and bring him back. And Kobe would go out and you have to bring him back. This constant, like, listen, this is what we do. Bring him back. And it would work for a while. Then it would break down. It would work and it would break down. But again, the one thing they had, no matter what, was they had two of the five best players in the, in the world on the court at the same time. Yeah. You had a quote from Olden uh, Polynice. They were just yeah. two alpha males who couldn't coexist. Even when it works, it never really works, which is probably the best summation of it. So you, you mentioned the time out there and how they would go at each other. So this doesn't sound like it was a, well, we just don't speak or interact relationship. No. This sounds fiery. These are at each other. Well, it's kind of weird. Yes and no. So if you, when I, I interviewed a lot of guys who covered the team during that time. And it's kind of weird because Shaq and Kobe, two guys, two very, seem very confident. A lot of their back and forth was through the press. Like the media would come into the locker room after the game and they'd go over to Shaq's locker. And maybe Shaq would say, he'd be like, yeah, we would have done better if somebody hadn't shot 26 times. <laughs> they all go over to Kobe's locker. Uh, uh, hey, Kobe, Shaq said they would have done better. Yeah, well... I'm just saying, maybe if someone could hit more than two out of 10 free throws, we'd have a chance. <laughs> they go back to Shaq. Well, maybe. Like, they're only 15 feet apart from each other in the locker. It's this huge, passive-aggressive, stupid thing. So 
they would have their moments where they'd have it out. They'd have moments of joy too. Like it wasn't all negative. They had moments of, you know, giddiness where they would win or some, it wasn't like they were rooting against each other to do well. It wasn't that. But the, so they had moments of direct confrontation. They had a couple of fights, but they also had a lot of passive aggressive, weird bickering. Mm. Cause I know there was a fight where Shaq says, this is my team. And yeah. Kobe, no, you're no leader. You're nothing. This is my team. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's the argument boiled down, isn't it? Yeah, but it's stupid if you think about it. Like, that's the thing about it. The biggest thing, the biggest takeaway from the book to me, from researching it, mm. is you two guys are idiots. Like, you're making millions of dollars. You're playing for the Los Angeles Lakers. You're winning NBA championships. And you're concerned with who the quote-unquote alpha dog is. Yeah. So it's like, get a life. Like, you're making millions of dollars to play basketball. You know, like... Right now, there's some vendor making $9 an hour trying to feed his kids, and you're arguing over who the alpha dog is? Yes. It gives you crap. It's the stupidest argument ever. Uh, and so Phil Jackson burning his incense and meditating, is he horrified at the uh, aggressive interaction, or is, is he trying to sort it out, or is he kind of thinking there's a healthy aspect to this, potentially? I think all of the above. I don't know how. I think he was horrified by Kobe at times and the selfishness of Kobe and just trying to get Kobe to play as a teammate. Um, I think sometimes he was bemused by it all. Like, it's kind of amusing to him, you know, and like, well, maybe this will help us, maybe it'll hurt us. Um, he was pretty big into letting the locker room figure itself out, not always being a babysitter, which I think is the way to go. Uh, I don't think he thought incense and handing out books was going to solve the problems. I think he thought some self-reflection would be helpful. I don't know if it was or not. Mm. I think most of the times when they did meditation, Shaq would fall asleep. <laughs> you know, like, nothing about that. Um, yeah, I just, again, I think like mostly it's like, all right, these guys are immature and they're annoying, but they're also really, really good. So let's just work with it the best we can, you know? And also, the, the Lakers surrounded them with really good role players. Like those locker rooms were always filled with smart veterans, always. So it wasn't like there were a bunch of 23-year-olds who were going to feed off of this and take sides and start arguing and bickering. It wasn't like that at all. They, the veterans knew what they were doing. They knew how to handle this. They knew it was kind of stupid, but all right, we'll, we'll ride it and win some championships. So it wasn't as bad. It wasn't, it wasn't as crazy as one would think. Okay. You kind of answered my next question because I was very curious about the locker room and if it was a case of, you know, uh, can you ask Shaq to pass the salt, you know, at dinner oh. time? These, these guys live together. It's day in, day out. I was wondering if you had a sense of whether or not the other teammates enjoyed their daily work. Yeah, they didn't. The thing is, like... Um, I'm telling you, most of the guys, the Lakers were really smart. So when Shaq and Kobe first got out there, they joined two other really good players. This guy, Nick Van Exel, who was a point guard, and Eddie Jones, who was a shooting guard. And they were both young, explosive, dynamic NBA players. And they were the wrong kind of guys to have in that situation. Like, um, what you needed with Shaq and Kobe, really what you needed, were a bunch of guys who were 30, 31, 32, who'd been around, who'd experienced a game, who wouldn't be shaken by this. You know, like Rick Fox was one of their stars, one of their role players. Rick Fox had been a star in Boston. He learned under Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. He'd, he'd been around. Robert Ory was another one of their guys. He won championships with Hakeem Olajuwon in Houston. He'd been around. You know, like a lot of the – Brian Shaw was a, was a star, uh, had been a really good NBA player. He played in Boston. He played in Shaq with Orlando. Now he was like 30 years old. Mm. He had lost his, um, his parents in a tragic car accident. Like he'd experienced life, you know, like – I just think all those guys, they were able to look at their relationship and sort of shrug. Okay. It's like, all right, whatever. And Jeff, the success comes, the three championships in a row, Phil Jackson's doing his thing. Does that put a degree of coolant on the fire in the relationship? Does it get better? Does it get worse through the successful years? I think it stays pretty consistent, which is not great, okay. um, but workable. I mean, I would say by the end, their last season together was 2003, 2004. And that was a nightmare. Like, that was the worst season ever. I mean, that was the year the Lakers brought in two superstars, uh, uh, Gary Payton and Carmelo, two older superstars, to make kind of a dream team. Kobe Bryant was going in a uh, – he, uh, he was charged with raping a woman in Colorado, and he was flying back and forth that season. Shaq was overweight. He wanted a contract extended. The Lakers didn't want to do it. Kobe was about to be a free agent. He was threatening to go to the Clippers, who played in the same building. Phil Jackson didn't know if he was coming back or not. Like, the whole season was just a mess. Mm. And when it ended, um, Kobe said to one of his teammates, this guard named Kareem Rush, he said, about Shaq, he said, I'm never playing with that mother ever again. Mm. Like, I'm just done. 
It so by go. the end of it, he was done. Okay. And did one um, assume alpha status clearly above the other at any stage in this thing, or was it pretty much, we, we, you know, there's two of us the whole time? No, I think Shaq most would say was the, the lead dog of those Lakers. I mean, he's was older and he was more important. You know, he was, he was unstoppable. He was more important. So, um, like I always say, I think if you took Shaq and whatever, a really good point guard, Steve Nash or Allen Iverson, I think they, those Lakers still win championships. If you take Kobe and a really good NBA center, but not Shaq, Alonzo Mourning or Dikembe Mutombo, I don't think they're winning championships. Like Shaq was at that time the most important part of that team. So I think by that standard alone, he was. And also Phil Jackson made it very clear Shaq is the center of this offense. And I think okay. I, so. I think those things combined made him that. And also he had this big personality, this really big, joyful, lovable personality that gravitated, that drew people toward him. Mm. Jeff, if you're covering this period and you're covering Kobe, you have to go deep into the sexual assault case, which you did. Just for people who are vaguely half aware of the details, it's a long time ago now, you might just paint broadly what happened. Yeah, so he was in, uh, this is 2003, and um, he, uh, 2003, and after the season, he, um, he went to Eagle, Colorado for knee surgery. And he didn't book it with the Lakers. He did it on his own, which pissed the Lakers off. They didn't even know he was getting a surgery. And while he was in Eagle, Colorado, he stayed at a hotel. And there was a young woman working at the front desk of the hotel. And basically, she showed him to his room. Then she, he invited her back to the room, came back. And they started fooling around. And she, um, the next day, she went to the police and said she was raped by Kobe Bryant. And this is a really crazy moment in the book and just in life where Detectives show up at the hotel the next day. Kobe had his surgery and he's on crutches. And they pull up to the hotel and Kobe's in the parking lot. They approach him. They're like, uh, they didn't understand why he was in the parking lot. They thought maybe he was tipped off, but they show up. And they're basically telling him that this woman accused him of rape. And at first he says, that's crazy. Uh, I don't, uh, what, rape? Are you kidding? Well, I don't understand. No, no, no. And then they kind of keep going. They're like, well, listen, she submitted a rape test. And we did a test of hair and her underwear. So then he's like, well, okay, well, here's the thing. I did have sex with her because he initially said he didn't have sex with her. So they caught him in a lie five minutes into this interview. I did have sex with her, blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, you, uh, when you read the transcript of this interview, him with the two detectives in Colorado, just as a functioning human being, you want to scream at him, tell them you need your attorney. Like, don't say anything else. You need a lawyer there. You need a lawyer there. He just keeps going and going and going and going. At one point, they're like, you know, we don't want to embarrass you here in public. Why don't we go back to your room? Let's go back to your room and talk that way. It'll be in private. But they just want him to take him back to the scene of the crime. And he does. So they go back to the room, and they're collecting samples and blah, blah, blah. And he, tell, he admits to them that he, he likes ejaculating in women's faces, and he likes grabbing women around the neck. It's this crazy, crazy interview. It's crazy. It's one of the craziest interviews I've ever read. And again, you're just screaming at Kobe, shut up and I tell them you need an attorney. Just, you know, from a legal standpoint, just tell them you need an attorney. And um, it goes on and on and on. And he's basically charged with rape. And I interviewed the, the district attorney on the case. I interviewed one of the lead detectives. They were both convinced he did it. Um, but during, as in the lead up to the trial, the woman, she was having a really rough time. She was being followed around by newspapers and tabloids and National Enquirer, blah, blah, blah. And she basically settled with him out of court. And the case went away. So, you know, it was, I think, really close to Kobe Bryant going to prison for a long time. And I'm not saying he did or didn't do it. I'm just saying the district attorney felt very secure in his case. The lead detective felt very secure in the case. So, you know, I think that easily he could have gotten to prison. I mean, around the time of his death, it was very clear that that still was part of his legacy. And even when, you know, I heard the news and we were covering it on the show that evening, which is what, 24 hours on from the death, uh, to what extent you cover that incident so soon afterwards is a question mark we all had. Ultimately, we did because it just felt too much a part of his legacy and not to, you know. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't seem to have dented his popularity, even before his death, I mean here, Jeff, and I don't just mean loyal 
Lakers fans. Like America at large seemed to really, really like this guy. It didn't seem to hang over him. So it did for a while. Like okay. it happened. He lost all his endorsements. He would show up in arenas. People would have, you know, prison outfits with Bryant number eight on it, you know, like stuff like that. And then I, he had one of the most inexplicable second acts I've ever seen. And I, the only way I can explain it, I don't, sometimes we in America, we, we make ourselves sound too important. Like in America, everybody blank, you know, in America, everyone blanks. But I will say, we are suckers for like a second act. We just are. We are suckers for a comeback. We love singers who fall off and have a hit 15 years later. You know, we love actors who are given up, you know, who, who don't show up on screen and then all of a sudden they're starring in a movie and we're like, yeah, the comeback. Like, we love that stuff. Maybe everyone does, but we definitely do. And I feel like Kobe, he went through it all. Shaq is traded. The Lakers suck. And then he comes back and wins these titles, kind of wills the Lakers these titles. Um, and toward the end of his career, he just was really likable. Like he just came off as really likable. And when he started, you know, showing up with his daughters, you know, he just seemed really likable. And I don't know. I don't know what happened. I can't explain it. You're hundred percent right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, I guess you can make the argument. He, he was never found guilty of a char of a crime. He was charged, but he was, I mean, um, I don't, it's one of the most amazing second acts I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen a second act like that. Mm. And I presume towards the end of his life, it wasn't something he ever, ever wanted to discuss publicly in an interview. Or did we ever hear from uh, the woman in the case again in publicly? No. And he, he was interviewed. The only interview I ever saw with Kobe about that at all was he talked to a Washington Post reporter named Kent Babb briefly about it. Uh, he wouldn't talk to him for the, for the book. So I didn't, I didn't get for that. Um, I can't blame him for not talking about it. It's not exactly a stellar moment in his life. Mm. But uh, no, we never, he almost never discussed it. Mm. Uh, your, your thoughts when he passed away? I mean, it's weird. Like you work two years on a book and you dive into this guy's life deeply. And then one day I'm sitting in a coffee shop, the book is done. And a friend of mine named Amy Bass texted me and said, uh, I don't, you know, something like rumors are Kobe's dead. And, uh, you know, like disbelief times a thousand, like legit sadness, like really sad. Um, when you find out his daughter's on the plane and all those other people are on the plane with him, on the helicopter with him, just, uh, yeah, it's just sad. You know, it feels, because 2020 is such a weird year, it feels a lot longer ago than it was. You know, so many things have happened this year. But it was, I mean, out here in LA, the thing that was interesting out here is it really educated me about the impact he had on people, um, sincerely. Um, I grew up in New York. I moved here six years ago. I knew Kobe was a big deal here. But when he died, all you kept hearing from people over and over again, especially young people, young people, people in their 20s, late teens, maybe early 30s, you know, Kobe taught me how to never give up. Kobe taught me how to be dogged. Kobe taught me that it's all about the fight and not giving and it's an amazing legacy. Like it wasn't even people weren't really bringing up Kobe won five championships. It was more about what I learned from watching him, you know, and that's pretty freaking profound. So that was, it was an amazing educational experience for me as a sports writer mm. about what, what it is about maybe an athlete that can influence people beyond just wins and losses. Good news, Damien. This is now a COVID free zone for the rest of the show. We're not getting into it. Thank God. <laughs> it is so grim. I mean, I know, and people are sick of it. So, uh, football, I don't need you to tell us that we don't have a goal score. So we can yeah. box that one away. We all get that. I distinctly <clears throat> remember sitting with you in the Aviva Stadium for one of the Mick McCarthy games, and they were trying, the Irish team were trying to play the ball out from the back, and you just had a raised eyebrow, and you were shaking your head because what you saw before you was not a pattern or a shape that made sense. You know, you're wondering, yeah. are, they, are these drilled? Is this off the cuff? don't like the look of this whatsoever. So yeah. put the same examination on a Stephen Kenny team. Are, are, is the pattern making sense? Is the shape making yes. sense? Is there a method yes. there? Yes. Yes, okay. absolutely. I can Good. see I can see I can see shape in the team. I can see patterns emerging over the number of games uh, that he's had. Um, I, I'm well aware that, that we are short of a goal scorer, which isn't necessarily a, a terrible thing uh, because there's ways you can get around that. And I mean like a natural goal scorer, a la Robbie Keane, but 
you know, you, what you can do is create situations to get people in scoring opportunities more often. You can create opportunities where you can pressurise the opposition uh, with sustained attacks is one way of doing it. So, you know, if you can pin the opposition in into the final third and get bodies in there, surely by by kind of weight of numbers, you will score goals or you'll create more opportunities to score goals. Um but look, this is an evolving thing. It, it, it is going to be for quite some time. Um, and, and unless, you know, I know we, everyone wants that number nine that can score goals and the football we're playing at the minute, um, it, I feel, will give us more of an opportunity to get more people in goal-scoring up, in, in positions. Uh, and then it's just up to, to people to take it, you know? If ever there was a game where the players might go uber pragmatic, it was a playoff game for European Championships away from home, and they didn't which really suggests they've bought into what Stephen Kenny's telling them. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 do, I do totally agree with that. I mean, you know, to go away to, from home in, in a qualifier, you know, to set up and maybe be a bit defensive and maybe say, do you know what, let's just try and inch your way through this game and, and nick one on the break. We didn't, we, you know, a lot of the, 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 the game was us forcing the issue, trying to score, trying to, to make things happen. And the score was at nil-nil. It was too often in the past Ireland would be forcing the issue, but we were one nil down or, or two one down. So um, it's positive, and, and and I am aware that people will be screaming it's a results business, and it is. I, I agree, but if we stick with this, you know, we will get better quicker, uh, as opposed to kind of operating in the in the, the environment where there was a very low ceiling. Um, and also, it's worth pointing out that you know. Ireland were probably, you know, at one point a tier two nation. Um, and I remember when, when I played in, in 2010 and, and 11 and, and whatnot, I remember playing against Georgia and, you know, without going too far, they were almost slam dunks, you know. It was almost like Georgia at home, it was, you know, easily 3 0. And I know we had uh, Robbie Keane playing at the time and stuff, but you could, you know, we were by far and away the better team. The last number of years, you have to admit, when you're playing the, the Montenegros of this world and the Georges of this world, they're getting pretty good. Um, and that's because they've been on uh, a, a path uh, that we haven't been on. We are on it now, and they're further along, and they're catching up with us very, very quickly. So whilst we weren't going backwards, we, we, we definitely were standing still, and, and Tier 3 nations are coming up quick. So we need to get our... Uh, our stuff in gear, really, and, and get moving and know that we're on the path. We just need to stick with it and uh, hopefully we can start progressing and moving forward pretty quick. Yeah. Dan, obviously, it's like the ramifications of Thursday night are uh, miserable, you know, really. We're talking about December 2022 before a major tournament, so it's, it's hugely disappointing. But within that, if you're being fair, I, I suspect you agree with Damien that we're seeing lots of positives here. Oh, definitely, yeah. I actually think after the last week, I mean, I've always felt that it would go well for Stephen Kenny, but there's always a bit of a, you know, there's just there's, there's always that bit of a niggle and thinking, yeah, will it really click? But I don't know. I think what what we're seeing now, um, it, it, it will work. I think I think it will. I think you can see the building blocks that are there. It's, uh, you know, it does seem that the players are have computed it that they're buying into it, um. And and really, like, of course, it's a results business. Um, but uh, but sometimes also, you know, do, do, you know, over I think over a long period of time, this is going to work out. And it, at times in individual games, you know, we, we allow the results sometimes to completely uh, cloud the analysis of what went before. Like, you know, you look at it last year, like Ireland played four big games. You know, the two games against Switzerland and Denmark. You know, one nil down with five minutes to go in all of those games. R rallied back to, to draw three of them, ironically enough. But the, the game plan that was there at the time just wasn't working. People say, people talk about uh, moving away from some game plan as though it was a game plan that was working. Mm. Like in all of the big games last year, the game plan did not work really in any of them uh, because Ireland ended up on the chase with five minutes to go. Um, and I mean, this this time last year in October, you know, we had the Georgia game, uh, which was terrible, and then an attempt to change the three at the back against Switzerland, which was just thrown together at the last minute and didn't work. Um, you, you fast forward now twelve months, and there's definitely patterns in, in what's been done. And it's people are always going to be reserve their judgment. People will always have their doubts, but I think you know the evidence is there if you want to see it. That that there is an, a, there is definitely a structure to what's being done. People, 
And I've talked about this before. People have had this view of Stephen Kenny that's very idealistic in many sense about how things would pan out. And maybe are surprised that, that there was evidence of some pragmatism last Thursday. Like sometimes pragmatism isn't always to do with being negative. Like the, there's a pragmatic line of thinking that you know, if you have more control of the game and more control of the ball, you'd have a better chance of winning it. Like that's also pragmatic um, in, in, your, in, your, in your mindset. And what we are seeing is a more positive mindset, but that is also the best way to create chances and win games rather than, um, you know, hitting hope at times or just at times. Uh, and we've seen this from the, the co-commentator who's, 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 you know, Mick is, is doing the co-commentary in a lot of these games and <laughs> including tomorrow. Um, just just cross it, you know. And the, one, the one thing about tomorrow that we will have uh, fans in the stadium tomorrow. So there will be a backdrop, there will be a volume that is different to someone defensively trying to explain away their work. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, the energies, and I, I've, I've actually been thinking about this on Sunday, the Wales game, I was really thinking about in the Wales game, there's a real contrast between going to games and watching them at home. There really is. Um, you're at the stadium, you get a lot more absorbed into what's going on. I think at home, because I've watched the away games at home, it's really unusual. You definitely are a lot more coloured by the, the commentary and, and, and what you're hearing. And I was just thinking some of the passages in the Ireland-Wales game on Sunday, yeah, you're watching it at home, it goes to nowhere, it's a bit flat. I, I see how the Aviva, over the years you see how the Aviva crowd, sometimes they just want four or five passes to respond to, mm. to just lift the volume a bit. And there were phases in the game on Sunday where the, the crowd, I think, would have actually really quite appreciated it. And by that, people's reaction is naturally warm towards it. But when it's in silence and it plays away to silence and it drifts away to nothing, and then you, you have someone there saying, well, maybe they should have crossed it in there, you know, just to see what happens. Um like I think that it, it's dragging people down <laughs> in, in some respects in terms of their experience of it. So I'm actually looking forward to. I think there might be up to eight thousand fans okay. there, maybe six and a half thousand, eight thousand fans there, and they'll get a bit more of the natural momentum of the stadium reacting to how a team is doing. I mean, people might actually see that this is going somewhere. It really is going somewhere. It'll take time, but it's going somewhere. But Damien, is there nothing to be said for throwing it in the mixer? Um, there is, like, yeah, I mean... Look, I'm, I'm joking, not... I'm joking, I'm joking. Yeah. I mean, if he, <laughs> say, if he says put in a cross one more time... <laughs> uh, I won't comment. What, where are we going to get our goals from, then? Um, like, I mean, there, there is players that, that can score goals and have scored goals. We just need to get them in, go in positions where, you know... Jeff Hendricks, for example, Aaron Connolly can score goals, Callum Robinson can score goals, McGoldrick can score goals, it's just he's never close enough to the goal to do it. He's usually out the pitch linking the play or, or, or doing something else. So um, And doing it brilliantly as well. He does, exactly. I'm, yeah, that's not a negative. I mean, you know, he definitely does. And mm. it's sustained attacks for me is, is, is one way of doing it. You know, if you can get possession, you know, say from the, the, the centre circle in the opposition half, you know, and the, and the final third, and, you know, if you can try to create things, and every time there's a clearance, you pick it up uh, on, on, on the edge of that centre circle and, and recycle the ball and, and switch the point of attack uh, and come down the other side, eventually you will wear teams down and teams get, you know, I know at the, at the very highest level, you've got to think Liverpool and, and, and Man City and, and they're very, very good sides that do that, you know, that keep you pinned in and you can't get out. Um, so maybe kind of going down that route, because when you do that, opposition defences and players get tired. And when people get tired, they make mistakes and you get an awful lot more chances. Um, for me, that's that's one way. And, and, and we're kind of on the road to doing that. Um, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Keith, Damien and, uh, and Stephen will be talking about this at length. And, and pouring over games and, 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 and video clips to see how we can we get players in goal scoring positions more often. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. I scored a goal in some kind of um, celebrity thing that I managed to get invited to, but Bez from the Happy Mondays was a goal. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I mean, like, he, he didn't put up much resistance, but he had the decency. He's a good goal, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that was 
one of the highlights of my life. Like, he was watching the match. <laughs> His head had been in goal. It's like, oh, that was a good goal, Tom. <laughs> Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. And you're very welcome along this morning. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10. If you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180 is the number. Owen, are you pumped? Pumped beyond belief uh, after listening to a bit of Dan MacDonald uh, in full passionate flow there. It's hard not to, to get a little bit excited. Not Hard not to get a little bit excited about the fact that there's actually going to be human reaction to things that occur on the pitch tonight, that we will have an actual gauge of things that aren't craftily... Uh, and, and artificially placed into our ears by EA Sports tonight. We're going to have an actual crowd to watch via our television sets. So I didn't I'm know that. that. I didn't know that. Is it full? Is it like a thousand people? Or are the Finns just like, ah, whatever, it's grand. There's no virus up here, it's too cold. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's actually one of the things. I, I, I always wondered what, what the story was with pe people saying this virus is going to uh, come back in the winter. I thought, I thought the coldness would be uh, something ag against that. I'm not. I'm not sure if that's uh, true at all. Good science there, maybe, Owen. Good science. Maybe, maybe Finland people uh, go by the same logic. I don't know how many people there are going to be in the crowd tonight. I would do with ten people uh, in the crowd. Just something that is not the kind of wailing of the, the management themes, which has been good as well. And they, yeah. they've been interesting. And they, like. Uh, it's it, they have been, it's been great hearing and trying to establish. Is that Keith Andrews? Is that David? It is. Duff? It's that, generally that, Keith Andrews. It, it tends to be. Uh, I've I've enjoyed that for sure. But actually, being able to watch people congregate a little bit. Now, I'm sure they're not going to be gathered too close together. I think it's going to be an exercise that we're all going to relish a lot more than we're expecting tonight. Do you think this is the end of international football? This might be the last game of international football that we ever see. Ever. Yeah. This is it. We're we're going out on a. Going out on a high, going up uh, against a, a Finnish team to, to conclude the, our, our entire international life. Maybe. I definitely think that we'll be doing well to be playing international football in November. Like I, 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 just, I just can't see that happening because of the fact that... Ronaldo. Champions League... Ronaldo. Ronaldo. That's Ronaldo it. It's a good point. So in um, the last 24 hours, if anybody is unaware of this, you might just be waking up and going, oh, what's the story? There's a picture of Cristiano Ronaldo helpfully taking a selfie at lunch with his Portuguese teammates and that is I think two hours before he tested positive. Uh, he is now in splendid isolation as it must be with Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, he's just wandering around his giant hotel suite preening in front of the mirror and checking out has his 12-pack uh, turned into a 16-pack and uh, what can he do to, um, to put this time on his own to good use? That's what he's doing at the moment in his splendid isolation. He's fine, he's doing well so it's okay for us to uh, to casually joke about this, but what's going to happen now is all the clubs are going to be like, no, 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 no. You can't have our players and send them back to us with COVID. Yeah, uh, it, it's it, it, like you, you definitely can't. Um, you, you also had a situation yesterday where Stephen Kenny was saying that Brighton and Hove Albion have been very good to us. That uh, Graham Potter is a, is a good football man. He knows what's what. And part of me reading those quotes was thinking to myself. If I'm a Brighton fan, how do I feel about reading this about my manager, that he's been very uh, accommodating to the, the national team uh, after one of our players was allowed to sit in a, a certain position of the, of the plane? I, I definitely a agree with what Stephen Kenny is saying about Potter, that he has been very, very accommodating to this Ireland team. But I can't see club managers being like that for too often. There is too much... Um, too, too much money involved in the club game over the next little while to to, to, to be able to, to say that the international game is worth it. But on, on the Ronaldo thing, I guess his kids are just going to be happy that they don't have to spot weights for their father, for his father and stuff like that. Um, because that's uh, whenever you see them on Instagram, it's just them standing idly by while uh, he's working out in the gym. So he'll have to work out on his own uh, for a little while, which is uh, going to be uh, a little bit of a disappointment for him, I'm sure. Oh, well, um, so no audience, unless he live streams it. I'm actually surprised he isn't live streaming it on Instagram. Just on Potter. They're not choice. The rules are the rules. Like, you can't suddenly say, oh, I'm not letting you go off and play international football because the rules are the rules and they're really clear. So we can say we will inflict, we will force, we will make our doctor go over and check him if you're going to come up with some nonsensical thing that wasn't wrong with him two days ago when he was last here and he was totally fine. If that's what you want to do, Graham. Let's go to war. So, like... Yeah, in fairness, he didn't test positive. It's not like Aaron Connolly tested positive 
So that, that's definitely, you would have to take a leap for sure. And I, 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 th that is a good point. But I, I just, I, I, I just think that when international managers are, are like, thank you so much for being so nice to us, I just wonder if club uh, fans, if club fans are going to be uh, a little bit touchy about that. I, I just think it all plays into the fact that this is going to be, next month is just going to be just a, a whole different thing. And on top of the Ronaldo thing, if you're going to move your pawns around Europe next month, if you're a UEFA, you probably want it to be for the Champions League and you want it to be for maybe not even the Europa League. You just want your prime competition to happen and maybe play the playoffs for the Euros next year and get those done. The Nations League, the Europa League, could they go by the wayside if you could play off the Champions League in your playoffs? I think you would take that if you were UEFA. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's what happened. I know you shouldn't be picking and choosing. It's I mean, the money. You, you, like, but it is. There is a bottom line here. Yeah. But like, what what a travesty will be if tonight was the last game. I mean, like uh, saying goodbye to to Mick McCarthy. Uh, is, is is he going to get his, his final farewell tonight? I mean, if, if this is the end of as a Colcom international football, you know, as Colcom. I mean, this is part of it. Like, we we don't just get Stephen Kenny and the Ireland team anymore. We get Mick McCarthy. This is part of the deal that we have as Irish football fans right now. That I wouldn't be surprised if we won tonight. Stephen Kenny went down to the an applause through the middle of the the park. People, players of the guard of honor for uh, a Mick McCarthy hologram as he walked down from the gantry. Even though he's probably commentating uh, off tube, uh, I, I just think this like this is something that uh, we kind of need to, I guess, learn to live with. If we were trying to learn to live with COVID, we should probably try and learn to live with. Mick McCarthy is Ireland commentator. It's uh, six minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM. You can get in touch 0879-180-180 is the number. Uh, Shane Hannan is with us. Shane, good morning to you. How are you? One of that sort of things. Just to, um, apparently six to 8,000 fans are going to be at the game tonight. So, Well, look, if it's if it's the end of international football as we know it, it's, it's not a bad game to finish on. Am I right? Hey. Hey. I apologise. Owen oh, and didn't see what you did there, but I did. Don't worry. I already <laughs> made that joke four minutes ago, but Jared didn't pick up on it. But oh, it's okay. I missed it. Sorry. Fair. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> I'm well, look, I, the, yeah, look, the thing in the build-up that has really struck me is, that, like, you've already touched on the, the lack of goals and where the goals are going to come from, but the Daryl Horgan's comments in the last couple of days about the honesty from him saying, look, even if the ball can hit off someone's arse and go in, we'll be quite happy. So I appreciate honesty from players like that when... They acknowledge the fact that we have no goal scorers in this team, that uh, we'll take a Shane Duffy header every day of the week. We'll take the ball whacking in off any, any any and all body parts for any goals. So let's hope we can scrape a 1-0 win tonight and get Stephen Kenny off to a to a first win in charge. You were full of um, the joys of Aaron Connolly. He's back in the team. What are you talking about? Surely, I mean, all the stuff that you were being the big man around town last week when mm. you were accurately, inaccurately predicting what was going to happen. Come on, Shane, stick with it. Courage of your oh, convictions, lads. I'm sticking with it. I'm sticking with it. It's gonna be a. It's gonna be a one nil. Maybe an Aaron Connolly goal. So uh, yeah, I have to stick with Aaron Connolly. He's he's gonna be firing on all cylinders tonight. He's chomping at the bit, as they say, uh, as the old cliche goes. So uh, surely he's gonna put in a decent performance tonight after the the last week that he's had. Is Robbie Keane going to be trending on Twitter tonight? <laughs> I mean, yes. Robbie's not a great goalkeeper. It turns out. Did you see? Uh... Claudine put up footage of the kid taking free kicks against the dad. He's not a very good goalkeeper. For somebody who's studied a lot of goalkeepers and watched a lot of goalkeepers diving too early, turns out Robbie Keane is prone to an early dive himself. Yeah, like <laughs> do you, do you, if you, ever you were playing World Cup and it was your time to go on goals, you could see Robbie Keane being the kid who absolutely did not want to go on goals. He would like run off with his ball instead of going in between the sticks. Like I'm not surprised to hear that. I haven't seen that video, but I'm not surprised to hear that. That's Check out Claudine's Twitter feed. Right, where are we starting? Yeah, we'll start with that game this evening, lads. Stephen Kenny's quest for a first win as Republic of Ireland manager has taken him to Helsinki. They play Finland, as we've mentioned, in the Nations League this evening. Uh, James McCarthy, the latest absentee for tonight's game, not COVID-related, thankfully, uh, but it's due to a hamstring injury that uh, he picked up at the weekend. James McLean suspended for this game tonight as well after that fairly daft red card he picked up on Sunday. Now, however, as we mentioned, Aaron Connolly and Adam Ida back in contention, having missed the recent games with Slovakia and Wales. Uh, the Irish squad has been hit by a number of COVID-19-related withdrawals over the past week. And despite those outbreaks, Stephen Kenny still sees the value in international football at, at a time like this. Difficult to be certain, but I think in life there are challenges and society must exist and you must try and overcome hurdles. Sport is an important part of life. People need something to look forward to. And the Irish national team are very important. Kick-off in that game this evening, 5 o'clock p.m. Irish time. Uh, a 7.45 start the other game in Ireland's group with Bulgaria playing host to Wales. 
elsewhere. England will hope to hold on to top spot in their Nations League group in this evening's match with Denmark. Uh, they replaced the world's number one team, Belgium, at the summit after beating them on Sunday. Scotland, who lead Group B2, look to continue their unbeaten start against the Czech Republic at Hamden Park, uh, while Northern Ireland, who are struggling in their section, have a trip to Norway. Last night then, Kai Havertz and Timo Werner both scored in Germany's entertaining three-all draw with Switzerland in the Nations League. Spain were made to pay for a host of wasted chances as Ukraine inflicted their first defeat in nearly two years. Spain had 21 shots in total, but Ukraine needed just one to score in their 1-0 win in Kiev in front of 15,000 fans. Spain now lead Group A4 by just a point from both Ukraine and Germany. Here at home then last night, Cork City rapidly running out of games to preserve their SSER Tristy League Premier Division status. The Leesiders lost 2-0 at home to Dundalk last night. Uh, Pat Hoobin's second half brace leaves Cork two points off the relegation playoff with just three league games to play. Our Premier League clubs will discuss Project Big Picture at today's shareholders meeting. The proposal, backed by Liverpool and Manchester United, would see the top flight cut from 20 to 18 teams. More voting power would also be given to the so-called Big Six, the plan has been criticised by the Premier League, the FA, the UK government and the Football Supporters Association, but it has been backed by the EFL. Uh, world number one, Dustin Johnson, has withdrawn from this week's PGA Tour golf event after testing positive for coronavirus. The American was due to feature in the CJ Cup in Las Vegas, but will be replaced in the field by first alternate JT Poston. And as you've already been mentioning, Cristiano Ronaldo, self-isolating after testing positive for coronavirus. The Portugal captain will miss their Nations League game against Sweden later. Ronaldo doesn't have any symptoms and will return to his club Juventus in due course. And Mark Allen is in second round action at Snooker's English Open this morning. The world number five takes on Robbie Williams, not that Robbie Williams. Jordan Brown goes up against Kurt Mafflin, while world champion Ronnie O'Sullivan faces Ryan Day. And finally for me this morning, lads, a story I'm sure you'll touch on that's uh, covered... Uh, Quite strongly in the papers this morning, Pori Joyce uh, receiving a blow ahead of the resumption of Galway's attempt to win the National League for the first time since 1981. Four panellists from Moy Cullen have had to withdraw after a COVID outbreak within the club's panel after their county title triumph. Uh, the outbreak will also impact on the Galway under-20 side, who are due to take on Kerry in the All-Ireland semi-final in Limerick on Saturday. Gareth Bradshaw, Sean Kelly, Paul Kelly and Desi Keneally are the Moy Cullen players in that Galway senior panel. Yeah, oh, and this is something that we haven't really factored into your power rankings, for example. Each individual county's ability to build a bubble or as much of a bubble as you possibly can for the next eight weeks. The teams who are able to do this will have access to their best players throughout the course of the championship, the straight knockout, the March Madness, uh, as it is. And that is something that we probably need to, uh, to think about. Someone definitely uh, tweeted us yesterday, apologies for, for, for getting their, their name, saying that uh, Donegal need to be, when you're talking about them in the power rankings, then you need to factor in the fact that the, the cases are quite high in Donegal or whatever county you're talking about. And they're not wrong. It's, it's true. There is a greater chance for counties that are desperately affected at the moment to develop an infection somewhere, whether it's within a club, whether it's within a, a training session. And we've seen it now with Moy Cullen, and it's kind of extraordinary, really, that this is the way it's happened as well, that... Uh, I, I guess there's been an outbreak at a club when we thought that the, the plug was um, pulled on the club. Uh, we just naturally assumed that everybody's going to be fine now and that they're going to be insulated and that the intercounty teams will do uh, their very best to ensure that the players that they do have available uh, will eventually take to the pitch on, on Championship Day. But not the case. The, the club season hasn't uh, finished with its dying sting just yet. And this is a, a fairly big blow to the Portage Joyce's team, especially uh, you'd assume that they will be back in a few weeks, though. And this will be for the conclusion of the league. And uh, like, it, it, is there going to be a way for them to work their, their way back in after missing uh, a, a game or two? I'm sure there will be, but uh, and, it's and, definitely going to... Yeah, and do they have a version of the virus that's debilitating and that has a, a sting in the tail, or do they have the asymptomatic version that loads of people have? Like, so we were he hearing some of the um, Fermanagh lads weren't feeling well at all. You know, we're yeah. feeling really sick with it. And we've heard people talking about just how sick you actually get with it. So, you know, that, that is a complete roulette. Um, I, I suppose if you're a Porrick Joyce, you must be absolutely raging because you felt like you'd managed to get to the end of the season and everything was grand. Presumably they weren't, and they, I mean, we're assuming, of course, that they weren't in any way showing any signs in the build-up to the county final. So you, this would suggest that it is in the aftermath of the county final that something happened and the cluster has happened. And, like, how did that happen? You mm -hmm. know? So... Uh, what was, was whatever caused the cluster and the outbreak worth it for the rest of the county uh, you know maybe it was I think, I think they've mentioned in the papers as well that it's it's a it's an outbreak in the, the moycullen community as a general as a as a whole uh so for contact tracing reasons the entire squad has been put on um on amber alert i guess so 
they have to just wait and see. These four players may be fine to play against Mayo on Sunday, but I guess they have to wait for these contact tracing uh, things to come back before they can make that final decision. Right. OK, OTBA on live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Thanks very much for that, Shane. It is, what, 15 minutes past eight here this morning. Uh, Michael says, too cold for a virus. Would it not be the opposite? Having a clue, but would have thought <laughs> flus are more common in winter. That's uh, we, we, we should clarify there. We were, we were very much joking. Um, I, 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 terrible attempt on my part to, to make a, a joke at 10 past eight. I mean, uh, oh, and morning. like, you know, everybody knows you're a scientist and that... Uh, you're actually Dr. Owen Sheen, but you're you're far too humble to um, to polish off your PhD every morning in, in microbiology and immunology and epidemiology. He's got he's got three. He's he's a three time doctor. Uh, I, did, I did two sciences for leaving cert. That's the frame behind you. If you if you could just uh, we'd see your PhD in the camera. Um, if you could just pan it up there, right. Uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to enter our competition in about three minutes' time. In the meantime, here's Enda Stevens talking to Willa Callahan yesterday ahead of Ireland's Nations League clash with Finland tonight. Enjoy. And obviously last Thursday, very late in the day, you find out that Adam and Aaron aren't going to be part of the squad. It's about two hours beforehand you find out about what's going to happen on Sunday. How difficult is it as a player? Because I'd imagine you know, you'll have had people down to mark certain players at corners and everything lined out, and then have to make so many changes close to kickoff. How difficult was that aspect of it? Yeah, it, it changes, but you you got to give credit to the, to the manager and the staff that everybody knows their jobs. Um, we're all in the meeting rooms together. Um, it's not just the 11 lads that are named to play, the subs, everybody else. They're all well drilled and they all know what to do. So, worst case scenario, if they do have to step in, um, they're, they're well prepared and I think that showed. As a defensive unit, look, it's been tricky at the far end trying to score goals, but you must be pretty happy with these first four games under Stephen and it's a record that stretches back under Mick as well. You've been very miserly as a defence. So you must be quite happy with the amount of clean sheets you're given. Yeah, it's 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 what we want to build on. We want to build on clean sheets, and, and hopefully, as you said, the goals will come. But it's not just really the back four. I think as a as a team and as a unit, I think we've improved massively defending because it's not it's not so much a case where we're sitting on the edge of our own box and eleven men behind the ball. We're putting pressure on teams higher up the pitch and and winning the ball back in better areas. And I think that's kind of resulted to us creating more clear cut chances in front of the goal. Particularly away to Bulgaria, yourself and Aaron Connolly seem to be developing a good partnership down that left-hand side. If he gets the nod to start in Finland tomorrow night, are you looking forward to uh, rekindling that partnership again down the left? Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's, it's, it's very important to kind of play as, as much as you can with, with, with lads and build up that relationship. And, and Aaron's a, uh, he's got a bright future ahead of him. He's, um, he's doing excellent for Brighton and, and hopefully we can kind of, as you said, build up that relationship and and uh, create a lot of goals for Ireland. And Stevens there talking with Will yesterday ahead of the game. Today we're going to hear from Anya Gorman around about 10 past 9 this morning and Nathan's going to join us a little bit uh, later on as well to give us his thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. What do you think is going to happen in the game tonight? Is it going to be Stephen Kenny's maiden victory? 87 180 180 and it's just one of the other things that we're interested in Owen this morning is the level of patience that people actually have with Stephen Kenny. Uh, you're seeing a lot of the uh, old school fans saying that uh, Martin O'Neill would have won the game in Slovakia and that Mick McCarthy would have won the game in Slovakia and I guess you know um, both of them can at some point point to a one-off victory in matches similar to that but uh, just not very recently it's been a while since either of those two managers had uh, one of those big victories so we'd love to hear from supporters uh, you can uh, get us using the hashtag OTBAM on Twitter or of course you can um, WhatsApp us on 087 Nine one eighty one eighty. Now, Expert Electrical is Ireland's largest electrical retailer with 67 stores nationwide. They've just launched a new look website. It's called expert.ie. Very easy. They have a huge range of electrical products from washing machines and cookers to TVs, laptops and much more besides. To celebrate the launch of expert.ie, they've given us a 200 euro voucher for their online store to give away every morning this week. Perfect timing for this in the run-up to Christmas. You can kick your morning off the right way here and win that 200 euro before... 10 o'clock this morning. So this is, if you're watching this on delay, tough luck. You have to be watching the show live between uh, 7.30 and 10 every morning. All you have to do is tell us who is our mystery voice. I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on from there. But I said, I'm probably not pretty on the eye, but he's all probably say anyway about me. But uh... <laughs> He's a man mountain who recently changed clothes. I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on from there. But I said, I'm... 
probably not pretty on the eye, but he's also probably say anyway about me about that. Find details of your local Expert Electrical store or shop online at expert.ie. Text your name and his name and WhatsApp it to 087 9180 180. Now, very excited to bring you this next bit. Up Close and Personal is a new series from Gillette where friends, teammates or sporting siblings get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, episode 1 is live now on the OTV Sports app or wherever you get your pods. It features former Ireland and Liverpool players Jason McAteer and Mark Lawrenson. Relax, sit back and enjoy. Hi, I'm Jason McAteer and I'm about to get up close and personal with Mark Lawrenson. How are you doing, Lauro? I bet you never, ever, ever thought in a million years you'd be doing something like this, would you? To be honest, I'm just glad I'm getting up close and personal on Zoom and not in person, to be honest. Oh, thanks very much. You're full of SH1B. <laughs> as much as I love you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, Laura, right, I'm going to start off quite simple. Are you a Liverpool fan? Yes, I am. Although, my favourite team, I think as most people know, is, uh, is Preston because when I was, what, 12, 13, all I, all I ever wanted to do was follow my dad, who obviously played for Preston, um, into the Preston first team. And I did that at the age of just turned 18. So they are always... And always yeah. will be my team, but obviously Liverpool because of you know the seven years I had, etc. So I'm lucky that they don't play in the same division. To be quite honest with you, did you enjoy growing up in in sort of the late seventies and, and the eighties when when playing around that time? Because you know the football fans were different to what they were now. Criticism used to come quite easily from the terraces. You know, obviously we there was racism in that time, football hooliganism in that time. Were you were you ever sort of conscious of what was going on, or were you just concentrated on playing football? Well, I went to uh, I went to Brighton um, very quickly. The story was that Liverpool had come in for me and, and bid seventy grand. Preston wanted a hundred grand, and my mum had remarried, and my stepfather was a director of the club. Talk about incestuous! Wow. Yeah, yeah, as it, as it, and he never told me. He never told me about Liverpool. There was no agents, and. That was kind of uh, in the end of the March, because that was the only transfer window. Yeah. And in May, June, uh, Brighton came in for me and offered 100 grand plus VAT, so it was 112 grand. And Preston went to Liverpool and said, ah, it's too much money. And then, of course, four years later, they paid a, a, a big whack. But um, going to Bright Brighton was fab. It was, it was just fab. And all our players, I think, apart from two, had been transferred in. So, obviously, I joined from Preston, and then Gary Williams, who's uh, from Litherland, he was playing for Preston in the first team. He came six weeks later, so that was great. So, I had a buddy and everything. But we didn't, we didn't see much of anything at Brighton because it was such a long way. Um, and we had crowds of 25, 26,000. It, 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 it was mad because there was no catchment area apart from 50 miles away in Crystal Palace or Southampton and stuff like that. But... We were kind of shielded from all that, in all honesty, you know, and there was never any scrapping or anything apart from when Brighton played Palace because they hated each other. And it was just like a, a nice, easy life and we were winning. So, it, it, you know, everything seemed really, really simple. We know it isn't at times, but, you know, we had two promotions and, and everything, so it was good. And how much money did you have in your pocket and what were you driving? Right. Um, I had an orange uh, Toyota Corolla. <laughs> And by the way, listen. Don't I, in an orange Corolla. I'll, You're not I'll, I'll, in an orange Corolla. No, I didn't need to do that. You saw me play. No, I'm only joking. Right. So, <laughs> um, and I bought it. It was like twelve hundred quid, right? And I just it was from a payment from my contract. And I lived in Lytham St. Anne's. Well, you'll know this, but Blackpool, which is just down the road, and Preston, yeah. they hate each other. Absolutely, totally hate each other. It's a real hatred, and hatred's a strong word. And I, I remember when I brought it and took it home and my stepfather said to me, what have you done? I said, it's a great car. I said, have you looked at the colour, by the way? And I went, ah, it'll be all right. Anyway, not long after I got transferred to Brighton and I drove with all my belongings. My mother was wetting herself, right? So no mobile phones, no nothing, no M23, no M25. It took me seven hours. And uh, I, when I left the house, she said, ring me. And I went, how am I going to ring you? She said, you'll have to stop at all the services. Nuts. But um, yeah, I rang about two or three times. So yeah, that was my that was my first car. Money in my pocket. 
I've hardly had anything. I think I was on 30 quid a week at Preston. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought that was good. What would that be relative now? How much would that be, do you think? Oh, money, like, sort of now? 30, what we look at? 32 now. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't Maybe 300. I don't, I don't know. We, see, we're in, the, we're in the old third division, which is what now Div 1. Yeah. And, of course, I was just a kid from school. And, and that was my money. And, and I, I wasn't there long enough to get a kind of get a second contract. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think my appearance money was obviously good because that, you know, enticed me to, to get in the team and stay in the team and, and one thing and another. But, yeah, we, I've still got a copy of my first contract, 30 quid a week. And, by the way, I am the only person in football ever to take his own signed papers, registration papers, to the – it was the office was in Lytham St. Anne's. So when I signed for Liverpool, um, Tom Saunders, God rest his soul, great fella, he said to me, you live in Lytham, don't you? I said, well, St. Anne's actually, Tom. He said, even better, because that's where the Football League offices are. He says, can wow. I trust you to, to take your own uh, papers in? And I said, yeah. So I took them in and went to the receptionist. And I said, oh, these are for such... And he said, who are you? I said, I'm the fella who signed the contract. She went, oh, really? We don't get many of you in here. <laughs> so, so the call comes... And Tom sends you to sign your papers. Mm. What's the feeling like when you you walk into that winning dressing room? What what is the the feeling of a of a young Mark Lawrence in, in the shadow of these great players, this great club? Well, the first person and only person I saw was uh, Suey, was Graham, and he had a, he had a black eye like it was been painted on by a makeup artist. It was perfect, and I arrived on a Friday night with with obviously Bob. Um, the doctor was there, etc. And there was, and it was just like about four of us. And Graham had been in for a little bit of treatment. It was early on a Friday, about six o'clock or something. And I, I looked at Graham. He looked at me, and he went, oh, "I said, don't worry." He said, "I did two of them, but the other one got me." And I'm thinking, <laughs> "Shine on!" But, you know, this this is the football club. And um, and Bob was well, Bob was like your granddad in charge of the team. So he 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 sent me to. Um, the Thingy Tower Hotel, right by the Liver Building. So I can't remember what it was called then. Atlantic Tower. Yeah, Atlantic right. Tower. Yeah. Overnight. So I can't sleep because, you know, um, I'm back home, basically. My mum only lives, they say, Lillian St. Anne's 40 miles away. So that was all good. And I hardly ever slept. Put my suit on the next day to go into the ground officially. And Bob came to pick me up, right? And the concierge around me said, oh, Mr. Lawrence and Mr. Paisley's here. So Dana come and all, all nice and smart. And as I walked out, he got out of his car. And it was like a, it was like a, a a gold Granada, right? And he, and, he, and he got out of it. And the first thing I noticed was he had his slippers on. On my, on my kid's life, he had his slippers on, and he got out. And the next thing, he had like a, a mustard color colored um, sweater, but a, a zip up one. And, I, and when I got close to him, he had egg on it. So he'd obviously had egg for his breakfast. And I just thought, I just thought European champions, because he'd just beaten uh, Real Madrid in, in Paris. I thought this this will do for me. I loved it. I thought I thought it was fab. And you know straight away, don't you? Can you just get this feeling and uh, yeah, it was it was great. Five, five what, what age what age were you? I was twenty uh, twenty-three, I think. So you're still and, a baby, really. Yeah, a little bit. Little bit, I, you know, I just hadn't had any sort of bad times in football. It was all good. So Had you, you won know, anything? Just two promotions with Brighton, two consecutive, and we and win them easily. And then and then we, we missed out on promotion to Div, what was Div One then, the top league by goal difference. Um, and I think Tottenham and Southampton went up, and we finished on the same points, but we missed out on goal difference. Then we went up the next season. Okay, well, you, I mean, you had an unbelievable career at Liverpool, and it was it was so successful playing with some some great players. If you could pick one player that you really enjoyed playing with, you were kind of on the wavelength and felt really comfortable. You look at him in the dressing room. For me, it was Maka and Robbie. If you look at the player and think, yeah, we've got a chance today. Who would that have been? Christ, that was most of the side, Jace. Was it? Because, it wasn't just one. Well, because, well, I mean, Kenny was Kenny was a genius. As a player, you know, he couldn't run, he couldn't edit, and he had a big fat arse, but he was an absolute genius. And then he'd have to say, well, rush it because he, you know, we'd keep it at nil nil and he'd nick a goal. But yeah. Sooness, Sooness never, ever really got the praise from other teams and players, probably because he'd like, he'd top most of them anyway. But he was, 
he was the manager of the side playing, and then there was Al. So I mean, B- Big Al was just it was it was easy for him. I mean, I'd co- come off ca- you know covered in shit and blood and everything, complete mess on my kit. And it's as though he just put his kit on and he just wandered off like he'd take the dog around the park. It was just, it was easy. Um, so there were so many of them, weren't there? That, that, that was the thing about it. So when you finish the game, Lotto, you're in, you, you get your shower, you get your big bath, they're all in the big bath. What's, what's, <laughs> Mark, what's Mark Lawrence putting on? Is it a bit of brute? Is it a bit of old spice? Oh, my goodness. Um, this is taking you a, back. It's a long, long time ago, Jace. Um, Maybe even nothing. Maybe, <laughs> m- mind out. you, my, listen, mind you. After, I mean, people can't believe the stories about the bath, can they? That we no. all got in one bath, shitted up, yeah. and, and yeah. like, and hardly anyone went <laughs> in the shower. It, it was bonkers. I mean, I remember. You know, well, we had two baths, didn't we? Two big baths, right? And it, remember at the start of preseason, and we had that purple stuff put in one of the baths. Yeah, on your feet for the blisters. On your feet. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We all bet Brucey one day that he wouldn't dive from the shitty bath into the blister bath, and he did it. <laughs> yeah. And we, listen, honestly, seriously, we all did it. And do you know what he? But did you know what he did? He dived up. I mean, there's only about that much water yeah. in it. And his unbelievable belly flop. We got. Oh my god, he was absolutely fine. Absolutely. He was, but he was bonkers. On. And oh, what was your? Oh, what, gr- go on. What was your pre-match meal? What was your, What would you eat before the game? Uh, chicken and beans. Roast chicken every, and beans. Every time. Are you superstitious, Laurel? Are you superstitious? Um, I was a little bit kind of super, only superstitious, not about where I went out in terms of onto the pitch, whether it was second, eighth, none of that rubbish, but my boots. And, uh, I, you know, if I played well in my boots, you know, even when they're all falling apart, like they, be, they don't, they go to the cobblers all the time, all the time, all the time, because they were me, they were me lucky boots. When you think about it, it's a load of bollocks. But if, if it makes you feel good, it does you good. Right. So you can shut your eyes now and you can go back in time. I'll give you the time machine. And you, yeah. you, when, you when you open your eyes, it's there in front of you. What, what are you doing? What, what is it? What's that moment? That moment is not playing against bloody Wimbledon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Because... I was, I Above was, all was, the cups and the trophies and yeah, because listen, because I, I reckon because I, mean, I was a, I was a rubbish trainer, but I, I didn't really need to train. It was just I was really really lucky. Jockey was the same, um, and I thought I'd have had another six years, you know, that, that extra six years. Who, who knows what you would have won? I mean, you might not have won anything, but I was I was starting to be greedy and thinking, Christ, I could fill, I could end up with like seven, eight league championships and stuff. So. Yeah, that 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 would be the the big the biggest thing. Well, that's, I was I mean it's been amazing. I mean I I got asked to do this job actually, and I, I thought I well, was just to chat with Laurel, but I've got to I've got to be honest, like it's opened my eyes up because we obviously know about Mark Lonson, but I don't think we do. Let me just ask you just before we finish, a couple of quick fire mm. questions. I really enjoyed it. What's your favourite colour? Red. What do you have on your bacon butty, sauce wise, red or brown? Brown. HP got to be. Is it? Yeah. What kind of undies you wear? Boxes. <laughs> um, where's your favourite holiday destination? On a house in Mallorca, so it's got to be Mallorca. And if you shut your, if you looked at all your medals and you had to play in one of the finals again, which one would it be? Eighty-four European Cup. Roma. That's That's I mean, don't forget, yeah, because don't forget, we're away from home, weren't we? People don't realise this, but so, so we win, you know, with the penalties and all that rubbish. And and Brucey ne- was never near any one of the five, by the way. He went the wrong way for all five of them, but one of them hit the bar, one of them went over. Their captain, the captain of Roma that night, ten, de- ten sorry, ten years later to the day, committed suicide. I mean, how wow. sad is that? Like, it's un- people don't know. And it's like, it was kind of almost kept under the carpet. Ten days, his name was, I think, Di Napoli. He was a really, really good player as well. Ten days, sorry, ten years to the day he committed suicide. Okay, well, let's, let's end it on, I mean, that's so sad. Let's end it on one. If, if you have to sum up Mark Lawrenson's career in one word, what would it be? Unbelievable. 
Well, because yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ever, when I started playing for Preston, ever believe that. I just thought that was it. That day at deep down, I thought I've, I've done it. Well, Lotto, that has been brilliant getting up close and personal. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I feel like I know you now, like one of the family. Uh, thanks a lot, mate. I really enjoyed it and take care. I'd like to say that was unbelievable, Jace, but I can't lie. Uh, there's a double act we didn't know we needed in our lives, but we definitely do a little bit more of Up Close and Personal with Gillette. We'll be running a bit more of those uh, across the course of the next year or so. And if you liked that little snippy, you can get the full thing on the OTB Sports app uh, this morning. Check out uh, on the Football Show podcast stream, OTB Football, rather. You can get it there. Nathan Murphy, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Chair. What's on the line for Ireland tonight? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> what are the permutations? No, just tell us what's on the line. I don't need the full permutations, but like, what ultimately, like, why does this matter? Well, I think firstly it matters because Stephen Kenny needs a win. We're four games in, and it's starting to drag on a little bit. And I think the performances that they've shown, particularly in the last week, deserve a victory. So first off, for the confidence of the squad, the confidence of the management team, for the entire shit show that's been going on over the past week, they need a victory to leave this group of games with a smile on their face. They also need a victory, I think, for our seeding for the World Cup draw, which takes place in December. A win here, a couple of good results next month, and there's a fair chance Ireland will be second seeds. Otherwise, we're looking at Ireland being third seeds in a group that only one team qualifies automatically from, and even the team that finished seconds goes into quite a convoluted playoff system. So you want to be in the top two and looking at the way the seedings have possibly been going like you could end up in a group of Belgium and the Dutch <laughs> worst case scenario like there's always uh, the possibility things work out in your favour but that's why all these ma matches matter and the other thing is you don't want to be relegated from your group in the Nations League so we got away with one last time out where they decided to change the Nations League so we finished bottom of our group we should have been relegated down to League C but they gave us a reprieve at the moment, Bulgaria are bottom. They play Wales tonight. Uh, you would expect that we should next month beat Bulgaria at home, and that'll be fine. But worst case scenario, you end up getting relegated and you finish bottom of this group and you're in with the likes of Slovenia, Luxembourg, who looks set to get promoted from League Four. Like, There's not too many attractive games in there, and that has a knockout effect then for a few years' time in the next European Championship. So these games now all have a certain sense of importance. But I think right now, they just need a win for themselves. There's all sorts yeah. on the line. Finance as well. Go on, on. They not just make like a, a five-team league B or something and just stay off the federal <laughs> relegation. Well, I wouldn't rule that out. I, with the uh, state of the finances of uh, European football, I wouldn't rule anything out at this stage. Yeah, it, it, it is quite about... So when was the last time that Ireland were a third seed for a draw? Oof. What? Jeez. Um, on the spot. Like, it, it kind of feels almost that finishing second has been somewhat of an achievement. No, we would have been, we would have been third seeds for the draw for Euro 2020, where we're in with um, Denmark and Switzerland. 2002 World Cup qualifying campaign as well, wouldn't we? Like we had the Dutch and yeah, the Portuguese. Yeah, Portugal and the Dutch. So listen, it can, it can be done, but you need... You're Roy going Keane, to have to produce it. Duff, Robbie Keane. Exactly. Richard Dunn. Uh, <laughs> Shake yeah, we had to... Some of Roy Keane's greatest ever performances, so... Yeah, it can happen. But listen, we've we've got you. We have been third seeds on quite a regular basis, and that's one of the reasons that we've struggled to qualify. And do, do you get the sense that from what Stephen Kenny has been saying this week, from what the players have been saying this week, that they have a huge idea of the importance? Not an idea of the importance of this game, but do you think they're putting a lot of weight on this game tonight? Do, do you think that there is still a little bit of short-term pain for long-term gain in terms of what Stephen Kenny can do experimentally, or are they very much thinking right now? by any means necessary, we need to clock up a couple of wins in this thing. See, I don't get this short-term pain for long-term gain. Like, if we had gone to Slovakia, so the suggestion there seems to be if we'd gone with something of a more pragmatic style of football in Bratislava on Thursday night, we might have got the result. If we threw a more cr few more crosses into the box, maybe we would have won the game. Like, so there's I, I nothing we've seen over the last few years to suggest we would have won that game with any different style of football. There's nothing to suggest we would have created as many chances as we did on Thursday mm. night with a different style of football under Mick McCarthy or Martin O'Neill. So I don't think there's any short-term pain. I think he's playing a style of football that already shows it can get results. They just need to put the ball in the back of the net. And as Daryl Horgan said, by any means possible. You cannot have better chances than Conor Howran had last Thursday night or Shane Long had at the weekend. You cannot ask for more in terms of creating opportunities. Somebody 
just needs to take them. So I don't think the players are in any ways really aware of certainly the Nations League permutations. Maybe it's been mentioned about the seedings for the World Cup draw. And it's been hard to get a sense of what the players truly think at all because first thing we're not around the squad we're not let near the squad you're relying on these zoom press conferences that really since friday since post-match in slovakia have just been dominated by covid so enda stevens yesterday talks for 20 minutes and there might have been two questions that weren't covid related likewise with stephen kenny as much as he tried to bring it back to football and i touched on this yesterday that you know i was as guilty as anybody when i was talking to him in the post-match press conference you could tell all he wanted to do was talk about the performance to talk about Jason Malumbi to be excited because he had seen what he had planned for the last six months start to come to fruition on the pitch against Wales. Yet it was the sideshow. It was COVID, COVID, COVID. Do we even have a future for international football? Could things have been done differently? So it's been hard to get a sense from the outside, which all the journalists are right now, of what's going on football-wise because COVID has just dominated this entire week. And yet they're, they're, the style of play is actually discernibly different. Like you can, you can literally point to how we keep the ball better, how we uh, try and be creative when in possession. And at the same time, from the first two games to the second two games, have got better as, as a, a team who are defending as a unit as well. Like there are clear signs that if, as uh, was it Jazzy pointing out that was there eight or nine friendlies that Martin O'Neill got to start with mm. when they were actually friendlies? And like, remember how bored we were of like, oh God, give us any competitive football uh, by the time that eventually rolled around. Imagine if that had been the scenario here, we'd all be going like, well, you know, what, 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 are we, what are we trying to do? Like, what, what does the team actually look like? Because we haven't had these competitive games. So what's your, what's your take on how patient people are being at the moment with Stephen Kenny, because I definitely see people making that argument that you were uh, rebutting earlier on about one of the other previous managers would have actually won that game, and then they also see the argument going, uh, they don't they don't like this. There's uh, text in going, what if are we in danger here of becoming uh, Georgia, uh, technically very good but not actually scoring any goals? I don't think we are because I think they've created so many chances over the last two games that the goals will have to come that like, they, they are chances that every day of the week those players should take. Like, you mentioned boredom, and I think that's a, a key point in all this under Stephen Kenny. A huge amount of people around the country have fallen out of love with Irish football because it's boring, because it's dull, because they don't want to pay their 50 quid on a Wednesday, Thursday night to go and watch Ireland in the Nations League because nothing is going to happen. It'll be a nil-nil, it'll be a one-nil, we won't have any possession of the ball, we'll scrape a victory, we'll scrape a draw... Whereas now, over the next couple of years, providing people get back in, from what we've seen over these two games, you can go and think, you know what, this is going to be enjoyable. This is an Irish team who are going to go and try and do something, who look like they've got a plan. When, As I keep saying, it's, it feels to me a very modern style of football, so they don't always dominate possession, but they win the ball back high up the pitch. They win the ball back in the halfway line. They get the turnovers that all the best teams try and do. And when they do that, they don't give it back easily. Sometimes they try and get teams on the counter-attack. Sometimes they are a little bit direct. But also sometimes they just sit back and control the game and try and put 20 passes together. Like Keith Andrews on Thursday night was probably the most vocal of the backroom staff, or maybe it was just I could recognize his voice a little bit more from the sideline, but kept shouting patience, 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 that it didn't need to be 100 miles an hour. It didn't need to be just fling it into the area. It was actually, when we get possession, let's take a breath, let's try and control this game a little bit more. And they did that. So, listen, there's going to be negativity. Some people feel Stephen Kenny doesn't have the CV, but I'm actually surprised that it's gone <laughs> performance-wise as well as it has, as quickly as it has. We've heard an awful lot from players in the last window about the amount of information that's been given, about the change in system. And you cannot deny, if you've watched those first two games, that it is a world away from what we were seeing a year, two years ago. This is a team who want to try and play a progressive brand of football. So the goals do need to come, results do need to come. I think he will get away with this month and next month and it looks as though there's going to be a friendly against Bosnia and there's games against Bulgaria and Finland in the Nations League. But next March, those qualifiers will begin. And if suddenly, you know, Georgia roll into town and Ireland aren't winning that game, absolutely the criticism is going to come, regardless of what the style of football. But this style of football looks as though it's going to get us more positive results because we're creating far more chances with it. Mm. Yeah, and like uh, I just want to be nice to have had this period last year and that it all comes to fruition perfectly before a playoff that that's where we 
oh, it, it, absolutely a wasted, wasted yeah. two years. Like one of the things that people had thrown out about a potential pitfall of Stephen Kenny was would he be able to command the respect of the dressing room? And obviously you can see the way that they're playing, the way that they've taken to his instructions that that is not going to be an issue at all. That, that's totally ridiculous. Like did that criticism, I wonder, that perceived criticism come from a place of maybe the, the Brian Carey era where coaching was different or where players were less receptive to, to coaching at that point? Have we moved on a lot in whatever the, the intervening 17 years where coaches like Stephen Kenny will get given a bigger break by their own dressing room. Yeah, I never went along with that anyways. I think yeah. the dressing room is a totally the Irish dressing room is a totally different place. Hang on. That. We when, don't have we don't when, have the superstars. Well, Go on. Well, well, sorry. Now it is but uh, it was definitely an issue under Brian Kerr. I mean, this is some this is for whatever reason revisionist history whatever this is not spoken about but that dressing room were not willing to listen to what he had to say in the same way that they might have been if he'd been somebody with Premier League experience. You can dress that up any way you want. You can debate this if you want, but that's certainly my memory of the the stories that were coming out at the time and all the back channel talk and all the gossip coming from the players, whereas, ah, oh, there's too much work, there's too many videos, he's making us do too much. And I'd say if you ask those players, and if they were honest now, they would say that they, they could have worked harder with Brian at that time to try and implement what he was trying to get them to achieve. Yeah, I'm not debating that. And here, you're uh, more senior than me, Jer, and I was uh, very much following <laughs> Ireland as a fan back in the Brian Kerr era. But like when this debate happened, the night the discussion was happening about Mick McCarthy, Stephen Kenny, and with Kevin Kilbane in studio, like Kevin, who is Brian's biggest fan, said, yeah, there were players in that dressing room who were looking at Brian Kerr and wondering how he got this job, that why wasn't it given to one of the other big names that were being linked at the time? And those players weren't the English-born lads, as they're often described. Those were some of the players who had come through the system here as well. But this dressing room is very different from that dressing room. And one of the things I always felt was that like Stephen Kenny was very fortunate with the type of player he was coming into. So like, who are the leaders in that dressing room? Seamus Coleman, who day one said, huge respect for anybody who works their way up the system, who's worked as hard as Stephen Kenny and gets this job and is not a throw toys out of the pram type of player. James McLean, who he had at Derry City, who he knows well. So McLean, again, a huge supporter when he was in with us last year, very much backing Stephen Kenny. Shane Duffy, who a lot of people will question, you know, can he play the style of football? Again, as a kid around Derry when Stephen Kenny was there. So some of those key players he knew, likewise, and the Stevens, the older players he'd been around, and then the young guys coming through, as we're going to probably see tonight, where maybe even three or four of them might start, the 21s, all seem to have been quite exhilarated by what they did at 21s level. And then the players from the out, listening to Callum Robinson last week, who probably didn't have a huge amount of connection with Stephen Kenny before all this, was raving about the work. And listen, players a month into this who are getting starts are always going to praise the manager. They're not going to be publicly critical. But I don't think that has ever been an issue. But these things aren't issues until results start going against you. And that's when the stories start coming out. So listen, I, it, does, it appears to be a very happy camp, I say that, uh, except for what's happened COVID-wise, where by all accounts, a lot of the players are pretty livid that Aaron Connolly and Adam Eda were in a position where they couldn't play last Thursday night. But I think that is shared by the management team. But like, is there a fallout from that when the players go back to their clubs and they realise you know, some of their teammates are going to the Euros next summer and, and they're not because of what they're looking at is pretty fine margins and these players missing. But well, I don't... Yeah, I, I mean, they, you can think that, but then we would still have had to beat the North. And, like, there's no guarantee that's going to happen either. It's not like it was... Uh, we no, it's not. It's not. But you're going into a game without two of your key players. Yeah, no, it would have helped. I mean, maybe, maybe the two lads should have sat where they were supposed to sit. You absolutely, know, there's absolutely. A, that, that, there's there's they, a personal responsibility a level. Here. But there, exactly, there's a personal responsibility level that keeps getting, oh, they're young lads. Like, well, come on. It's the same with any of the GEA teams who are celebrating, who then uh, use whatever, uh, who then potentially become super spreader events. It's like, let's all take responsibility, as we've been constantly told about this, and uh, and stop pointing the fingers at everybody else going, oh, you should have done this, you need to tell me this. It's like, Grant, wash your hands, wear a mask, sit where you're supposed to sit, and who knows what would have happened. That was a bit of a tangent that I uh, didn't necessarily need to go on there. So, <laughs> style of play tonight, Nathan, and the team. Uh, Darryl Shea is going to start at centre-back. Uh, 
it, well, he'll start uh, somewhere across the back four. The great thing about Daryl Shea and why he's going to get a lot of caps quite quickly, I suspect, is that he can cover pretty much anywhere along that back four. I came into this run of games thinking that nobody would play the three matches, that Thursday night was going to be a pretty grueling affair, but it was 90 minutes, 120 minutes. Emotionally, it would take a lot out of the players. But with everything that's gone on, that's obviously not the case. And they do now need a victory as well. So we probably will see a number of the players playing tonight who've played every minute of the two games uh, so far. And screw the clubs uh, would be rightly, I think, the attitude from Stephen Kenny. So, again, hard to get a grasp. Not everybody fully trained last night. You're not getting in to see the session to see what he might be thinking. But I would expect Darren Randolph will play in goals. You're probably looking at a back four of Doherty, Duffy, O'Shea, Stevens, or maybe if Kevin Long is okay, they rest Shane Duffy. He's got a big match coming up at the weekend. But like, are you resting your captain to prepare no. for a, an old firm? I don't think you are. Uh, again, middle of midfield, Malumbi and Howerton, though if he feels Howerton, who has put in a big, big shift over the last couple of days, and I think been really impressive, uh, unless he thinks maybe he needs a rest, then you put in Josh Cullen there. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was Malumbi and Howerton. Again, uh, Connolly will play on the left. Brady will play uh, either on the right or as a number 10. Maybe Brady plays as a 10. Hendrick gets a rest and Daryl Horgan plays on the right. And I think Adam Eda will get the chance to play as a number nine. Or he may go, you know what, Jeff Hendrick again, like Connor Howard has been pretty good, is getting to grips with that position I want him to play. And I just want to get these players on the pitch as often as possible. So, yeah, I think he's got a few options in there. And that's the one thing that's come out of this, actually. Like, we spent the last couple of months when we debating the Ireland team. It's all about Coleman and Doherty. And that is the big choice he has to make. If everybody's back fit and available, he's going to have quite a few choices to make, particularly if he's going with this 4-2-3-1, because Jason Malumbi was excellent. Conor Howard's done nothing wrong over these two games. And if you throw James McCarthy back into the mix, now he's out of tonight's game, and it's two from those three, like suddenly you've got yourself a nice little headache and you're quite happy. That you've got plenty of options in there. Um, what is the story with the Finns? Are they any good? Uh... I think they're probably feel they're at a similar level to us. How much can you read into that game in the Aviva back in September? I think we pretty much all written it off from both sides. There was no pace to it. They managed to make a winner. We were very open that night. Ireland were very, very open, very like the Bulgaria game. They caught Ireland in the counterattack, and that haven't been seen quite as much in the last two games. Uh, they won at the weekend. They beat Bulgaria 2-0. Timo Puki missed that game. He's missed the two games so far, but he was at the press conference yesterday, so it looks as though he's going to start. He had a toe injury, uh, though he's admitted his form and his confidence isn't quite where... It, well, it certainly wasn't this time last year where he was banging in the goals at the start of the Premier League season. So, they, like, they looked a good technical side in Dublin. They were not that dissimilar to what Ireland are right now, trying to get the ball down, trying to do the right thing. So, like, if you're looking for predictions, you're going with your traditional one-all or maybe nick a win. Uh, but... Yeah, they looked they looked an okay side. They've already qualified for Euro 2020, so so they're better than us, essentially. Well, they would they would they would look at it and go on recent results. Unquestionably, they would feel that they're a, a stronger team than Ireland. And they have improved since the game in Dublin, where they beat us one 0 as well. Mm. Right. Yeah, you'd have to expect their fitness levels have have gone way up as well. And they had a fairly straightforward victory over against Bulgaria at the weekend, and they pooky coming back into the side. Yeah. So what if we Powerhouse. lose? This? What if, what if we lose this game? What's the, what suddenly then? How sharp are the knives? Well, the knives will be sharp, but like that's the gig. Uh, again, a lot will depend on performance. And because of COVID, everything's overshadowed the fact that like, they've struggled to get training sessions once again. They've had little time on the training pitch. It sounds like we're making excuses for Stephen Kenny, but like this is not a normal international window. This is not a normal international situation that any other manager has had to deal with. But... I think if Ireland go out and again they play a good brand of football, they create chances and it's a tight game, I think, yeah, the knives might be out, but I don't think they're going to be particularly sharp. If they get ripped apart defensively or they're as open defensively as they were in the first two matches, then there will be criticisms. But I, I don't think that's going to happen. OK. Uh, news coming through this morning that the New Zealand soccer team is not going to play against England as they were scheduled to on the 12th of November, uh, 13th of November, New Zealand time. This game was supposed to be in England. Obviously, New Zealand has managed to get to a point where uh, life is going on pretty normally. We've seen it in the rugby matches. They're having uh, nearly full stadiums because they can't really be asked going to watch uh, New Zealand against uh, Australia because, you know, it's like, phew, what's the big deal? 
And um, yeah, so they're saying the shifting nature of travel restrictions and commercial flight availability under COVID means that we do not have certainty we could assemble a squad at Wembley on this day and defaulting on this fixture at the last minute is not an option. So I wonder how much political pressure they were put under not to go and fly to the uh, COVID rampaging England. Um, mm. So, you know, in the context Ireland of international are, football. I was going to think there could be an opportunity there for uh, the FEI in Ireland, but at the moment it seems they're penciled in to play Bosnia in a friendly as a sort of third and fourth place playoff from those Nations League defeats last month because the international calendar needs to be filled and everybody has to, should play a certain amount of games for the TV deal. Uh, it looks as though Ireland are going to be going to Bosnia, whereas if they could uh, just nick in there and step in in front of New Zealand, it'd probably be a little bit more lucrative. Good thing about man, if only uh, the new incoming FAI chief executive had some connections with the mm. FA. Oh, wait. Football's coming home. Get him on the phone, give him a call, tell him you can have that one for nothing, Nathan. Uh, okay, no bother. Good thing about man. All right, thanks a million. Nathan Murphy with us this morning, Cheers, helping lads. to preview uh, Ireland's one all draw with Finland tonight. If you want to get in touch this morning, uh, the text number is 0879-180-180, and that's the number you need to enter our mystery voice competition. Expert Electrical is Ireland's largest electrical retailer with 67 stores nationwide. They've just launched a new look website. It's expert.ie, where they have a huge range of electrical products from washing machines and cookers to TVs, laptops, and much more. To celebrate the launch of expert.ie, they've given us a 200 euro voucher for their online store to give away every morning this week. So why not kick off your morning the right way today on OTBAM and win that 200 quid before 10 a.m.? So this has to be live. All you've got to do is tell us now, who are mystery voices? Have a listen. I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on it from there, but I said I'm probably not pretty on the eye, but he's also probably say anyway about me, but... Uh, yeah, have one more listen. Who's this? I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on it from there, but I said I'm probably not pretty on the eye, but he's also probably say anyway about me, but... Uh, Text your name and his name to 87 180 by WhatsApp. It has to be by WhatsApp. Uh, you can find details of your local expert electrical store or shop online at expert.ie. It's time for the papers. OTB AM. As you can imagine, it is um, the back page is absolutely dominated by the Ireland game tonight. Law and disorder. Uh, Kenny bemused by HSE's rules that barred you. Oh, he's making the point that any other country in Europe, um, they would have been able to play. This is the two lads who were ruled out for because of contact tracing, which ultimately around a false positive. So, look, I'd say at some point he's going to feel like he needs to stop talking about that because you don't want to become associated with it. I've had a false start. Kenny hoping for a change of look as he admits that lessons have been learned. COVID-19, Moy Cullen withdraws all players. Galway footballers have become the latest panel to be hit with a COVID-19 outbreak after uh, Moy Cullen withdrew their county contingent. The club obviously won its first county title in its history earlier this month. But a local outbreak has spread to their senior football team, including some that are part of the football and uh, senior under 20 panels. The Telegraph uh, picture of Ronaldo, Wolves and City alarm is Ronaldo hit by virus. So obviously Wolves and City worried about their Portuguese players. And Ronaldo was having lunch with them yesterday. Clark claims Rebel plotted breakaway. The uh, civil war in English football shows no signs of abating. The examiner for you this morning is a um, picture of the under-20 team. Jim Crawford says the dream is still very much alive despite the fact that they lost 2-0 yesterday. Ireland out to end losing and testing week on a high note. They need a win. They absolutely need a win. And false positive confusion needs to be addressed, says Stephen. So that's end of Stephen's uh, adding to that conversation. We've already heard from him on the show this morning. The um, Irish Times. Kenny and Ireland looking for a little sparkle to end grim window. Anything to lift the... Uh, mood of the nation would be good, you know, I'm sure the Finns feel exactly the same way. Kenny, we must all learn lessons. He's talking about what they'll do differently next month if uh, it all goes ahead. Galway plans hit by Moy Cullen's virus outbreak and the GA are set to roll out rapid testing. That's Colin Key's story. He's been on that the whole time. Uh, there will be rapid testing for inter-county squads to make sure that there's a full range of clear tests for teams who are playing in big games. Serious test of patients. Kenny, disbelief at false positives. Questions HSE's two-metre rule for tracing. And Wenger, pick Ozil, Arteta. Arsene Wenger butting in, butt out, Arsene. Uh, getting rid of um, Mesut Ozil is actually one of the best things that Arteta has done in terms of saying this is actually going to be a meritocracy and we're not just picking you because of the money we're paying. And there's that picture of Cristiano Ronaldo, which has the managers of every player, uh, club managers of every player at the table going, oh God, how many of them are going to end up being infected? Ronaldo's tested positive. That trial forces Trippier out. Kieran Trippier put in his WhatsApp group with his mates that he was leaving, and uh, his mates bet on it, and he's going to be suspended from football because of it. I think this is a little bit harsh. 
think there probably needs to be um, a sliding scale of uh, what constitutes inside information. Um, Kenny, lessons learned. FAI, better prepared to deal with COVID scenarios next month. That's the Herald. Uh, Danish Sizzler is the Racing Post. The uh, Guardian back page is uh, Premier League anger at Parry could scupper 140 million bailout. And rallying call. Let's end tough week on high, says Randolph. So Darren Randolph uh, is... He's quoted on the back page talking about that. So, where do you want to where do you want to go? We'll start with hurling this morning, and we're bringing you a brand new slot. So you're very welcome to hurling man of the week. Sting coming for our, whenever we do this the second time, which could be months and months and months. Because uh, you're welcome to a brand new slot where we pay tribute to the men of our country protecting our game from the invasion of the dreaded notions. Ku Cullen would be spinning in his grave this week if he knew what was going on. He'd be spinning a lot with the way notions have crept into the game. We need hurling men to put those people back in the box. So congratulations to this week's hurling man of the week, who is John Kiley. Now, John Kiley has this week been fighting the good fight against notions. Specifically, he has been waging war against the yellow slitter, which is set to be used in this year's inter-county hurling season. Can you believe it? A yellow slitter. Not a, a ball that is actually yellow. It's incredible. So here's what he's actually been saying. We all know the reason why helmets were introduced. Because people were losing eyes and teeth. It was very clear cut. Slitter. I've never heard anybody complain about the slitter up until this point. And you know, it's been introduced now and we just have to get on with it. Just have to get on with it is hurling man speak for this is an absolute travesty and I am already plotting my very brutal revenge. Uh, he said, I just don't have any real understanding as to why this decision was made. I don't. I don't believe there was a wide enough conversation had across the association about it either. It's a huge change to be making to the change to the colour of the ball that we have been using for over 120, 130 years. I just think it's crazy. Crazy. Listen. It is what it is. We move on. Imagine getting in a DeLorean, going back 120, 130 years, telling people in the 1890s what was to come. Would there have been any revolution at all? Would there have been any quest for independence had they been told that there was a yellow slitter coming down the road? Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, Joe Canning and Brendan Maher have also rode in behind Kylie. And I think the tone here is that leave the yellow balls to the Gryffindor seekers. They're all about keeping their white balls in the All-Ireland Hurling Championship. Uh, now, a bit of a, a fact for you here. Hurling, of course, not the first sport, far from the first sport to, to go through a change in colour of ball. Tennis had to go through similar changes in the 1960s. Doing a little bit of reading on this this morning, didn't realise actually that David Attenborough was the controller of BBC Two at the time and was instrumental in bringing colour television to Wimbledon for the very first time. Wow. So people at home were struggling to distinguish the tennis ball from the line. So they brought in yellow balls to counteract that. So there you go. I'm not, I'm not sure would uh, even a, a David Attenborough run BBC be powerful enough to move John Kiley in his fight against Notions this week. So congratulations, John Kiley, our first ever Hurling Man of the Week. Did you ever watch winter Premier League matches, as I guess they would be, where a different colour ball got broken out? Or, worse still, one of those instances that we've seen on... Uh, that does the rounds on Twitter and YouTube from time to time, where they continue to use a white ball in the snow. Have you ever seen those games? I, I certainly have. Yeah, it's, it, what was it, 2010? The, the great snow, uh, which uh, kind of halted the Premier League for a while, the games that did go ahead, they were kind of mad, weren't they? I mean, it, was also, it was always an option in FIFA as well to be able to change the ball to yellow, which, uh, which is always something you would do. So, um, yeah, like, I mean, the, part of this whole story as well has been about the fact that there is concerns about the weight of the ball, that they got a little bit screwed over with yellow slitters at the Fenway Classic, and a couple of the hurlers are, in fairness, concerned about that. That but they won't be able to score from the, from the puck out anymore. I mean, that, might be, that might be a good thing, right? That might be a good thing. Maybe what we saw uh, at Fenway, like uh, aside from all the fighting, was it was actually a futuristic version of hurling where you know you should actually be able to, to work your score and all of that. Um, like, but I, I think that no, I know that the, the GA have said that there's going to be no difference except for the color. So whatever they were doing, whoever was soaking the white balls in salty water in Boston on that occasion probably needs to be pulled in front of uh, some sort of uh, GAA committee 
Uh, but uh, the current ones, I think, are, are going to be okay. Uh, Anonymous on YouTube says, like the old football matches with the orange ball in the snow, sign me up. What about this? Well, like, have we missed an opportunity to, you know, extend the hand across the barricades here and make them orange in celebration of our orange brethren? <laughs> Uh, obviously, it's a very serious point. Um, Inclusivity, and, yeah. you know. Look, yeah, look what we're doing. Come and feel, come and play with the orange balls. Yeah, like as part of the new casement, that could that could be it. Break them out and, uh, as a, the new casement is unveiled. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. What else? What are we talking about else? Well, it's uh, OTBAM, so we have to talk about Dr. Richard Freeman. I just hope that Dr. Richard Freeman's trial just goes on forever. And like, even if it just becomes a, a spin-off reality TV show where it's like Judge Judy, except it's always, you know, uh, Defendant. Defendant Freeman is a daily television show that I would watch because this is absolutely class. So it turned out yesterday that uh, he, first of all, got himself a free bike. So e emails have been seen by the court uh, where Richard Freeman and Shane Sutton were interchanging messages with one another and uh, there is an email in which uh, Freeman tells Sutton the bike arrived today how much do I owe you so Shane Sutton is after getting a bike for Richard Freeman and he wants to know how much does he pay for him and then when he was pressed by Simon Jackson yesterday on whether or not this was a gift Freeman responded it's complicated so Ooh. In terms of what he's actually said yesterday, he says coaches and staff and friends of friends, business associates were often given bikes that were reported as sponsors bikes. They were often marked down as used, but were brand new. I was offered one by Shane. I got this bike and I thought I'd have to pay for it. Shane subsequently said, you don't have to pay. I went to the financial controller at British Cycling with my checkbook. He told me Shane's cleared it off the budget. Shane said, you've been given it as a gift. It's a gift. Later, he said, remember that bike. You didn't pay for that bike, which uh, is why he said it's complicated. Uh, basically, Shane Sutton reminding him where his uh, bread is buttered. Uh, he was asked, was there an option to return it yesterday? And, and Freeman said, yes. And then he was asked, did you? And he said, regrettably, I did not return it. <laughs> I gave it as a gift to my wife. <laughs> what are you going to do? The bike in question is a Pinarello Prince. Ranges between three and four and a half thousand pounds. Oof. Just looking online today. Good four-star ratings by uh, Road.cc, by all the, the top-class uh, cycling websites. I mean, you're a, a man who knows his uh, good bikes from his bad bikes. I think a Pinarello Prince would be something that might pique your interest. Wow. I mean, if somebody... It looks amazing. If somebody emails you uh, out to your OTB email and a Pinarello Prince was in question, you would certainly quickly realise where uh, your bread is buttered as well. Uh, just one other thing from yesterday. It, it, it tends like it, it's almost like the perfect sit, not perfect sitcom. It's just like perfect drama, where you get all these extraordinary details every day, and then you get like a dollop of seriousness in there as well, where they're actually kind of achieving things. Where we're, we're seeing uh, a lot of the psychology of Freeman here, or the culture in British cycling. And yesterday's hit of realism was on Team Sky hiring doctors that have an imperfect past because if you remember that was the whole thing at the start of the day Brailsford everybody's got to be squeaky clean we can't hire anybody with uh, a doping past and I mean Geert Linders was essentially hired eventually hired by, by Team Sky and we all know what, what, what a disaster that was I know Brailsford's come out and apologised for that but Freeman was talking about that yesterday and he says uh, it wasn't a very happy camp at times the riders were used to cycling doctors experienced doctors I was a fish out of water they wanted more experienced doctors who knew cycling. And, and you get this sense that either this is the truth or this is what's being put forward, uh, that Freeman is definitely pushing this idea that he was very much a deer in the headlights. And, you know, he was, you know, a puppet and Shane Sutton was the puppet master or the culture of cycling was what we should be looking at here rather than him. So the trial continues and hopefully more of this good stuff to come. Yeah, amazing information coming out of that uh, trial. So what are we at? Nine minutes past nine this morning here on OTBM. OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. I want to tell you about what's coming up uh, over the next while on all of our social channels and on the radio. OTB Sports in partnership with Cabri FC have kicked off a brand new series of in-depth chats with some of the biggest names in world football. The um, most recent one with Teddy Sheringham and Gary Neville has gone ballistic on YouTube. You should check that out. But the fourth episode 
sees Harry Redknapp and Glenn Hoddle sit down for a chat. That's upcoming in a couple of weeks' time. Keep an eye on OTV social channels and on OTV Sports Radio for more info. Check out CadburyFC.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. And the fifth episode is going to be a doozy for Liverpool fans as well. We'll tell you about that a little bit closer to the time. Anya Gorman's going to join us right after these. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Sunday paper review on OTB. While they cannot control what happens later on in, in the evening, they can do something about the source. And the source are the games and the finals. And as cases rose, it's the right decision. And until the public health climate starts to change back in the right direction, I think we'll see some of these games uh, still on ice for quite a few weeks and months yet. Digesting the best stories on the back pages every Sunday afternoon on OTB Sports Radio. Tune in 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Looking for a football show with a bit of a twist? Team 33, the football magazine show for the football purists. And it's been a complete failure for English teams in the European formats this year, Con. I don't know. I Come mean, on, it has! They had, they, had won, they had one team in the quarterfinals. The very best interviews with the cult heroes of the past and a look at the cultural side of football. Team 33. Live at 9 p.m. every Friday on OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Right, Republic of Ireland forward Anya Gorman is with us. Uh, good morning to you, Anya. How are you getting on? Hi, how are you? Uh, why can't we score goals? Yeah, I don't know. Like, look, I think... Everything behind the scoring goals has gone well. Um, we're keeping clean sheets and um, passing the ball with purpose, creating chances. Um, I just don't think we've gotten the rub of the green. And I think it's that final third, which is obviously the most important um, piece of the picture that just needs to come now. Look, like the next Robbie Keane's just not going to fall out of the sky in, in the next few days. So I think we just have to keep tipping away and then eventually the goals will start coming and the confidence that we see them in passing and getting on the ball that... Hopefully that starts to come in the box as well. Can you just explain to us a little bit about what that confidence, what difference it makes as a player in in your own ability to actually score goals? Because it, it seems like, as you say, the chances that we've created have been rel relatively clear cut, and you would expect the the players who have the chances have fallen to to score them. And so part of it's been bad luck with you know, Brown hitting the post. You kind of feel like okay, maybe that's just bad luck. But uh, the the rest of them just they weren't. They snatched at them, you know. Uh, it's definitely a lack of confidence. So, what does what is the amazing impact that confidence has, and how do you suddenly give yourself confidence when you don't have it? Yeah, I think that's that's a little bit of composure as well in, in their moments in the game and your decision at the time whether you're going to pass or shoot, like we've seen in the in the Slovakia game as well. Like, t look, it looks like Stephen Kenny's and still the teams with great confidence playing out for the back, knocking the ball around. So I'm sure they have done a lot of work in in training and getting that confidence and a lot of it will come through their club form as well um, if the attacking players are scoring goals creating goals as well that and that will uh, breed confidence and I think once they, they finally get uh, start putting knocking the ball into the net then it will, will just uh, go on from there It does seem like the defence and midfield actually have taken a quantum leap forward from the first two games where things looked very disjointed and players didn't look sharp and it turns out they weren't fit. The preseason had been rubbish for everybody, and then the next two games, they started to look fit and sharp. They were in possession, and as you say, they did have confidence. So, is it just that the last bit gets layered on next, and it might actually be the November window before we see everything joined up properly? Yeah, I think so. Look, I think obviously the defense has been impressive in the the last two games, and like you said, they just that match fitness as well. Like with the kind of upset preseason, a lot of the the players will have had at their club due to the COVID and stuff like that. So that will interfere. And you can see the players are coming in now that are getting game time or a lot sharper. And look, the final third scoring goals is obviously the hardest bit of playing football as well. Like goals win games. So look, it will come. And I think they'll be obviously working hard and training. And like you're missing the likes of obviously in the last games, your Aaron Connolly's. Look, Adam Eda can score goals. Troy Park can score goals. McGoldrick had a good game. I think he probably played a lot of his good football in kind of more of a 10 role than playing in a in a number nine and getting in behind the fences as well. And look, Shane Long has goals in him too, so he missed obviously a good header against Wales the other day. So look, the more chance he gets it, eventually the ball will go in and it'll take off from there. 
Yeah, it's, a, it's something that we were hoping for, I guess, in the past, whereas now we're expecting the Ireland forwards to put away their chances, which I guess is a good departure. Like, Is it the hardest thing to do to, to score goals, or is almost playing in a way and playing in a, in a way that makes sense and creating the opportunities actually the, the elementary thing and, and, and is the harder thing to do in, in some ways because we haven't had it for so long? Yeah, definitely. And look, it's I think everyone will agree it's been a much more attractive game to watch, uh, getting the ball down and, and playing football. And look, they have created chances. Like you said, Alan Brown hit the post uh, against Wales. Shane Long header over the ball. So look, it's just a final piece of the jigsaw that needs to come. And I think it's something that you can't overthink either and get try too hard to do either because then it doesn't come and get frustrated with it. So I think they just need to keep playing their football, enjoying their football. The chances will come and then just start taking them chances. Is there anything that you would like to see done differently in terms of how Ireland have approached the last couple of games? Because it's definitely been a lot better, but could it be better again? Look, I think it's progress. Look, Stephen Kenny's only been in for um, a few games now. He had a tough game against Slovakia, and obviously the COVID um, has caused a bit of havoc with having players in and players out with selection and the short time to prepare for games as well. And like, if you look at this window, like they've had three games and. They're going to have three games in less than a week. And look, the, the squad has, has changed massively throughout the duration. And they're probably missing maybe key players as well. So it's, it's obviously been a difficult period for uh, the coaching staff and the players as well. But I think they've, they've done a good job. And hopefully they put in a good performance against Finland today. One of the really interesting facets of last Sunday was the fact that Matt already slipped into centre-back and looked totally fine after months and months, months of us speculating that he couldn't play as a wing-back uh, fr from a full-back. Uh, how difficult is that to, to play in a, a multitude of different positions from your own perspective? Uh, and how important is it that the, the players around you and that the coaching is, is top-notch to, to ensure that it goes seamlessly? Yeah, like Matt Dodd did a great job when he went in and um, sent it back and so was Christy obviously replacing him in the full back around and I think he's probably down to a lot of criticism over the Seamus Coleman, Matt Doherty debate and Matt Doherty being more of attacking um, win back. But look, he, he slotted in, look comfortably, he probably didn't have much time to think about it and I just think it shows his his quality as a player to adapt and he's just willing to, to adapt to whatever position he can to help the team. When you're being asked to, to play, say, as a, a full-back for the international team, if it's a, a different role you're given for the club team, is that jarring at all? Or is it something that once you put on the, the green jersey, you kind of go back into that mode immediately? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's uh, something that's probably um, the situation I'm in. I play kind of wing, um, attacking player for my club, and then um, play more of a defensive role when I came back to play for Ireland recently. So... Um, look, I think he adapted. It might take you a training session or two to get back into the rhythm, but um, when it's kind of consistent, the players that are playing around you as well, when you put the green jersey on, look, you're willing to do whatever you can to help the team to get the performance and get the result. Yeah, like we overrate sometimes the, how complicated it is to switch positions because, I mean, they're professional footballers. They're all incredibly competent at, at doing the basics. But if the system is right, that. I guess they, like how complicated can it be? Is 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 that way too unfair on on a player like Matt Doherty and what he's doing in terms of playing different positions? No, look, I think he's adapted well. Um, he did incredibly well when he went in and um, sent it back and looked comfortable. You know, probably we might see him there again tonight, um, and and see how that fares out as well. Like I think once the if the management uh, and the coaching's good and everyone knows the role and knows their position. Um, you would hope that most players um, with a good quality can step step into um, to help the team anyway. Um, are you surprised by how quickly the change in the style of play has happened? That here we are four games in and we are now a, a team who likes to keep the ball and pass it to each other and uh, are passing way more than we have done at any point over the last decade. Yeah, I think like I think we always knew that Stephen Kenny was going to come in and try and play a, a different brand of football and um, more possession based than maybe we were used to used to in the past as well. And look, it probably only took him two games to, to get into that rhythm as well. And it's great to see um, the quality of players that we have and how quickly they can adapt as well. And obviously the confidence he's gave them and the players are have bought into the to the system as well. So. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not that surprised to be honest. Um, I think uh, Stephen Kenny is very adamant and very um, meticulous to attention as well. So, look, hopefully we'll grow now and keep the clean sheets going and, and start putting the ball in the net. You mentioned McGoldrick. <clears throat> Pardon me. You mentioned McGoldrick did a lot of his best work as a ten. It would have been really interesting to see him playing as a ten with Adam Eade as a nine, and at some point maybe the two of them might actually be fit to uh, to play together, and we we might see what that looks like. And I, look, I don't know if if 
Kenny thinks of McGoldrick as a 10, but will you give us your um, attacking portion of the team? If you were Stephen Kenny, who you'd pick? Yeah, like I think um, at the moment, obviously, selection like McGoldrick's out injured. Um, they're missing their Robinson and O'Dowd because of um, the close contact as well with the COVID. Um, look, I don't think I think McGoldrick is a nine, but I just think he just got drawn in a lot to the game to help the team, and he did some some really good work as well, and just didn't uh, get get maybe get the chances that he deserved to get in the game. Um, Aaron Connolly for me um, has to play. I think he some gives us a different uh, dynamic, a different attacking threat, and I think if he had been playing even on the bench against Slovakia, he would have came on and, and done some damage. Um, I'd like to see Troy Parrott back in the fold as well. Um, but I think at the moment it has to be Aaron Connolly, McGoldrick up front, um, probably between O'Dowd and Robinson for the, the right wing. And then we can't forget Robbie Brady either with, with his delivery and, and his technical ability. Yeah, it's funny. He, he clearly loves Robbie Brady. And uh, I have a feeling that Robbie Brady is in his team if he's fully fit. And, and maybe he's in as that third midfielder and it's Harahan and... Uh, well, I'm not sure actually. If it if it is Harwin and McCarthy and Brady, where does Jeff Hendrick go? Maybe Jeff Hendrick plays as your ten, and it's actually a, a different formation. The, the, it would be great to have like a run of games where you could experiment a little bit with this, and there was no pressure. But every game has had its own internal pressure. The first game, because it was the first game, has pressure. The second game comes straight away afterwards. In fairness, he changed the team quite a bit. Those two games were kind of write-offs. Straight away, you're into a, a playoff for a European Championships, and now you kind of need to win because you haven't won. So there's not really that much room for him to experiment with what his favourite lineup might be and who might be playing. Do we play with a false nine? I don't know, you know, all that kind of stuff. You would like to have the opportunity to even the training sessions to try it out. Yeah, look, and there's not really many actual friendly games. They're all um, Nation League game now and the pressure, like it's came on taken fast as well with the playoff just around the corner off the back of the first two games. Um, now, like you say, they're searching for the win. I don't think he's ever really had his squad fully fit either like McGoldrick was out of the, the first camp for most of it he came back in um, for the last game and um, so I don't think he's ever really had his his core group of players all fully fit and, and ready for selection as well so look there's a lot to think about and um, it's hard to nail down and I'm sure that that's a, a good um, thinking point for Stephen and the coaching staff. Can we just talk to you briefly about um, build up to the game against Ukraine? I'm right in saying it's uh, Friday, October the 23rd. So that's actually like two weeks and a bit away at this stage. Yeah, so it's uh, actually Friday week. Yeah, we're playing um, Ukraine away, and it's obviously a crucial game for us in, in our quest for qualifying for the Euros as well and um, trying to secure at least a, a playoff spot. So, um, yeah, look, I think we're all looking forward to it. We had a a tough game against Germany, but it was good to get back in after the long break and, and train together and see the girls and, and prepare now for this Ukraine game. When you've seen the kind of chaos that COVID has wreaked on the men's team over the last while, are you like making sure that nobody's allowed to visit you? You're not going out. Are you are you trying as best as you possibly can to 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 while at the same time trying to maintain uh, everyday life? Yeah, I think so. I think it's obviously. Um, been a bit of an eye opener all the the havoc it's caused in in the Irish camp as well and um obviously it's not a, an ideal situation and you want to be available to play so I think you just have to obviously follow the guidelines that are out there and um, limit your contacts uh, like they say keep your distance sanitize your hands wear your mask and um, just do all the practical things you can and just give your best self the best chance that that you don't um, obviously catch the virus coming up to a crucial moment and hopefully it won't have an impact in our camp next yeah. week. And, and clearly the FAI have learned a lot of lessons from it as well, so you'd hope that they'll be able to apply those to, to your camp. Um, when do you actually end up meeting up then? Um, so we're flying out Sunday. So, um, yeah, so we'll have a week training then until the game in, in Ukraine next Friday. So um, we'll have a good little stint of preparation. So really looking forward to it. OK, and your own form and fitness all good? Yeah, all good, yeah. So, um, obviously, we're going into our second phase of games now with the Women's National League. We're playing Galway away on Saturday. So, um, PMA are sitting top of the table at the moment. So, we need to try and continue that form and, and prepare. We've Champions League qualifiers coming up in the start of November too. Does it mean a bit more to you now that you've come back after being away? Because you, you, I think people are probably familiar with the story at this point. You, you got to 100 caps and then stopped playing international football for a while. And I remember having you on and you were like, well, I'm not quite sure if I'm finished. Maybe I'm finished, maybe I'm not. And you probably clearly had it in the back of your head that you were definitely going back. So does it mean a bit more now? 
yeah I think so I think you probably appreciate it a little bit more and I think it's probably like everything you get older and, and look back it, it's um it's a little bit more uh, precious then as well and look I take relish every moment I can to get out and get the green jersey on and help the team and hopefully we uh you know uh, qualify for the Euros now in England. And did Covid make any difference to like even sharpen the desire to get back and play again and kind of just remind you that you made the right decision to go back? I think when you're absent for something, it's like when you're out injured or you're away from it, I think it makes it nearly makes you hungrier and you kind of miss it more then and everyone it gives everyone a, a fresh fresh outlook and, and drive to get back playing. And again, the other thing is that like um, there's been this surge in support for the women's team over the last 18 months or so. The Germany game, a lot of profile around it, there's going to be a huge profile around this as well. You'd hope that it feels like just a positive thing as opposed to bringing added pressure. Is it? Is it all, is it uniformly positive or is there that little bit of extra, ooh, there's extra eyes on us here? No, I don't think so. I think it's all positive. You have to, I think, relish it. It's where we want to be. It's uh, We want to be competing to qualify for tournaments and, and bring all the uh, the attention with it as well and promote the game, promote the women's game for to everyone in the country. So, yeah, now I think uh, you just relish that and, and hopefully you go out and put in a good performance. Well, listen, enjoy the next week and the build-up and uh, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks a million, Anya, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. It's uh, Anya Gorman there, uh, over 100 caps for her country and giving us some thoughts on uh, what should happen tonight for Ireland against Finland as well. 0879-180-180 is the number. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, you can use the hashtag OTBAM. Now, marking the conclusion of 20 by 20 and celebrating a transformative two-year moment and movement for women in sport, you're invited to a virtual event at midday on Wednesday, the 21st of October. Uh, it's legends of Irish and international sport, the biggest names in world sport, Martina Navratilova, Ada Hagerberg, Rachel Blackmore, Brian O'Driscoll, Sonia Sullivan and more as we discuss and debate what future we want for women in sport in Ireland. Uh, check out the Think It, Ask It hashtag or the 20 by 20 social media channels for details on how to register. Really simple. You click the link, you sign up for it and then you can watch Martina Navratilova um, uh, as one of the keynote speakers. She's part of a panel with, um, I think, with Brian O'Driscoll and... Ada Hagerberg as well, um, or maybe Rachel Blackburn on that panel. But it's an amazing lineup of guests who are on that day. And OTB Sports is, of course, a proud partner and supporter of 20 by 20. Andy Moran's going to be on the way in just a couple of minutes' time. First, here's Damien Delaney on the different propositions facing professional footballers and GA players during the COVID pandemic. Have a look. I would want to be nowhere near a work situation like that. I th it's so admirable that the players know that this bubble has been burst and they're hopping on flights. Yeah, but ultimately it's their job, right? And um, and they get paid for it. And I suppose like they can't switch off for it. And what's the, what's the alternative? Just 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 down tools or, or take some time off. You can't do anything. I mean, it's even worse for for the GA players. I mean, they're amateurs, and people are, are, are asking them to go back and, and play. And I, I'm definitely of the opinion that if I was a GA player, and and for all the reasons you just stated there, and it's not your job, uh, and it's optional, then then I would be going nowhere near it. But that's just me with these guys are professionals it's their job they have to do it um and would, no, no, would, would none of that be so you know i asked you how you'd cope with it and you talked about get on the pitch do my job yeah you think you'd be able to park the family worries for instance yeah i think you, you would yeah um i think you would probably have to adjust your situation at home maybe if you had elderly relatives or you had uh, a child with maybe some underlying conditions or you had a, your partner had some underlying conditions or something like that because Ultimately, it's a job and you have to do it and you may take precautions when you're coming back from these international trips or you're coming back from training and maybe you have to be a bit more cautious, but it's a job and you just got to get on with it. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective from Damien Delaney. It is your job, you've just got to get on with it, was the point that he was making there, own. Um, and I think we're about to see a load more GA players decide that actually... The next five, six weeks isn't going to be worth it. The news was coming through yesterday that uh, Mickey Quinn is not going to play this season for Longford. He is going to play next year. They've um, just had a new baby. He's a teacher and just made the decision that actually, you know, with the new baby and going out, with the cases rising, um, now this is all coming from his manager uh, in an interview with our game yesterday. So we haven't heard from Mickey himself just yet, but uh, they were the reasons that his manager gave. You wouldn't be terribly surprised to see more players make that decision over the next while. And on top of that, the other reason is that if you're a player playing in the Leinster Championship, there is no back door if you happen to run into Dublin. And is it worth it? 
is the question that a lot of people will be asking themselves going into this championship as well. It's unfortunate they probably needed to condense the season in some way. Maybe you could have played a backdoor anyway, but I think more importantly than that, with a backdoor, you would have thrown in a whole other pile of fixtures that would need to have been played and run off smoothly. The more fixtures there are, the more chances there are of an infection happening. And with that, then you don't have the comparisons with what Damien Delaney is saying. It isn't just a job. It's not your job at all. In fact, your job may be something that you're clinging on to at the moment. It may be something that you're in a precarious position in at the moment. Will your playing of GEA and putting yourself at risk as a result of playing GEA put, say, your job at risk? That is a reality that might face a few people, and it's pretty easy to know what the decision is to make in this particular year. I think even in professional sports, to be honest with you, nobody is that judgmental with people who decide to opt out, as has been quite uh, a popular thing to do in the United States, for example. It isn't. Uh, just your job at times. It is a bit more than that. It is life and death for uh, a lot of people and for anybody with uh, who's even related to people with underlying conditions. So I see what Damien is saying to, to a point and I think a lot of people will be looking at it like that but it's more than just a job at times and it's particularly true when you talk about amateur games. It's funny that there have been very few people, as far as I know, who have opted out from football right across Europe. It's not a story that kind of uh, had any sort of domino effect Whereas in the NFL, for example, loads of players pre-season decided, OK, I'm just going to sit this season out. Why is that? I, 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 like we, can, can we name one person, even in Premier League, who, who made that decision? I, 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 I certainly can't. I know somebody would probably, there probably has been a couple of stories, but it's been, it's been minuscule. And we saw it in the basketball as well, despite the fact that they were flying into a bubble that they wouldn't play. So... I don't know, maybe it's just more of a, a culture of realising that, you know, maybe there will be people in your dressing room who will judge you for opting out. Maybe there is more of a culture of that in uh, in football. Uh, and maybe the United States was just in a in a more precarious position when professional sports were coming back. I mean, the, the, their late summer was particularly grim when the NFL was coming back. So there's probably different nuances here that allow us to kind of appreciate the differences between the two sports cultures. But if somebody came out as a result of what's happened over the madness over the last couple of days and says, actually, I'm taking a break from sport at the moment. I will play all the domestic games you want me to, but I'm not flying abroad. Would you really judge that player? I certainly wouldn't. No, not at all. And I certainly wouldn't judge any GAA players who are pulling out. I Definitely mean, not. We have so frequently spoken about the imbalance in the competition in the past and, and you know, Longford was one of those counties, famously Dennis Connerton had, had uh, done an interview years ago where he was talking about 40 or 50 players and he'd asked to join the panel, he just weren't interested because they were like, look, what's the point? And it's so clearly transparent that the competition doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to have a population centre of 40,000 against a population centre of a million. It just makes no sense whatsoever in, on any level except that we got handed down these county boundaries uh, centuries ago and decided somehow this was going to be an administrative centre and we were going to then design games and competitions on the basis of that. Like, it makes no sense whatsoever uh, if there was a four divisions and there was promotion and relegation, then maybe that might make sense. So, like, perhaps the upshot of players deciding that they don't want to train for five or six weeks, professional style, um, and not knowing exactly that everybody else on the panel or in the backroom team is taking the same precautions they are, you can totally understand that. And maybe it lays bare the fact that the competitions don't make any sense and maybe they use this opportunity to force home competitions that do make sense. Maybe it is. I, I don't want to... You have to pick your words carefully around this, but maybe it is to some degree an excuse. And I, like, I'm, I'm not saying that in the negative sense whatsoever. I'm saying that it is kind of almost the, the straw that breaks the, the camel's back in, in a certain way that players who play for certain counties surely can't be enjoying it as much as players who are playing for an elite county. It is just impossible to surely glean, glean that amount of enjoyment out of something where you have a substantially lower chance of winning than some of the bigger counties. And maybe this year when uh, COVID comes along, maybe it's kind of like, do I really want to put myself at risk to play in a competition that we have not a prayer of winning? Yeah. And then the answer will be no. So, like... I, I use the word excuses is, is it can, has such negative uh, connotations. Reason. But a reason. A, re a reason. A reason. There you go. That's that's the word I was looking for. And I think that's totally fair. I think that if and if that comes full circle, then in a year or two years, where the conversations are more accelerated because of what happens this year, then that is a positive consequence. That like if people are reassessing things, that if 
the competition was a level playing field, would people be more willing to take a risk this winter? I think the answer to that question is definitely yes. A hundred percent. I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, like definitely going to factor into a lot of people's thinking. Other people just want to go and play games and play ball and this is an opportunity for them to do so and I completely accept that. And fair play to them because, they, you know, they're pushing a rock up a hill and, uh, and they never get there. So 0879-180-180 is the number if you want to get in touch this morning. You can uh, use that as our WhatsApp number for comments or, of course, you can use it to enter our competition. I'm going to give you the last chance to enter our competition now. It's our mystery voice. Expert Electrical is Ireland's largest electrical retailer with 67 stores nationwide. And they've just launched a new look website, expert.ie, where they've got a huge range of electrical products from washing machines and cookers, TVs, laptops, and much more. To celebrate the launch of expert.ie, they've given us a 200 euro voucher for their online store to give away every morning this week. So why not kick off your morning the right way today on OTBAM and win that 200 euro before 10 o'clock. All you got to do, so the next 20 minutes, is um, text us on 87 Nine one eighty one eighty, and tell us who is our mystery voice. I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on it from there. But I said I'm probably not pretty on the eye. But he's also probably say anyway about me. But uh, you can have uh, one more listen to this. I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on it from there. But I said I'm probably not pretty on the eye. But he's also probably say anyway about me. But uh, a big old firm game coming this weekend, and probably partnering Dario O'Shea at uh, centre-back for Ireland tonight. You can only enter this morning on WhatsApp. Give us his name and your name and send the message to 87 180 and you can find details of your local Expert electrical store or shop online at expert.ie. And uh, look, we all know how important it is to support local, uh, particularly around this time of the year. A lot of businesses are going to be looking for your local business. So if you can, shop local, expert.ie. Uh, they've got uh, all the full range that you need. Um, one last point on that competition oh, and then the other side of that is that the teams who can somehow get their players in a situation or a scenario or who have the most players who can possibly cocoon themselves away are going to be at a huge advantage and it's it's the weird scenario we're in but um, the best ability is availability. Definitely and I think in a strange way the, the balance of advantage has been tilted away from Dublin a little bit in that regard where uh, like I think if everybody's working from home then if you look at say inflections outside of Dublin they've been obviously a bit, a bit lower consistently over the last month or so and thereby less of a chance of, of anything happening to a, to a squad member and like there's that we'll have Andy Moore with us in, in a moment and I'd just be interested in how big a burden it was trying to navigate your training sessions around the country to accommodate for all those people on the, the eastern seaboard like have they now just gone back to training in Mayo I presume that's the case uh, because of restrictions, obviously, but I presume that's also the case because a lot of people have maybe moved home, and I, I wonder if that's uh, a big advantage for some of those teams. Yeah, and some counties will have had the access to players that they might not have had if players hadn't moved home. So at 9.37 this morning, I'm delighted to say Andy Moran is with us. Andy, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Morning, lads. Uh, before we get into the football, we may as well talk about real life. Um, lo level three lockdown as a, as a gym owner and an operator and who obviously wants your clients to come into you. How has this been and, and how are you getting on with that? It's the uncertainty of it all in business, really, which is the problem. It's um, it's it, it, it's we're 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 okay. We're one of the lucky ones where we've got kind of multiple businesses where we've got a gym and a leisure centre. We've got uh, small areas too for individual training where we can do that, so we can keep open. But it's uncertainty of where we're going from now on is the is the big problem, and it's the I suppose the co consumer confidence and like if you know the way gyms run, you do guys. So you buy a month, you buy three months, or you buy a year. Do you know? And how do you if you're a customer, how do you decide what you're going to buy? How long are they going to remain open? Do you know what's going to happen in level four and all that kind of uncertainty is there ahead of everyone? Do you know? Yeah, totally. And and as an industry, I like I. I don't know what the representative body for the industry is or how you even make representations as a big group to say look this is an important outlet for people you can see the physical benefits you can see the mental health benefits you can see the business benefits like if there was some decision made that irrespective of what level we're at a certain element of access was going to be available then at least you'd have certainty to your clients and say well if you do sign up for a year I know I can give you X number of classes or X number of contact hours Exactly. I think that's the, the major point for being. It's underestimated how important industry is to people. Um, we've got a group there, they're special needs adults uh, with their carers and they come into us, you know, and they, we've assigned a room to them so they all live together so they come in and work out together. But the importance they have to do an hour in the gym, 
to go away around walk for the lake and then they come back in and do an hour in the pool and it, it it's the highlight of their day it's their outlet for the day so people just look at young fit people like ourselves but they don't look at the greater community and what the importance of a, a leisure center can have for people in, within that community I mean, it's nice of you to butter us up by including us in uh, our, ourselves there, Andy, as a plural, but uh, compliment taken, but uh, swiftly batted away by myself and Owen. Yeah, look, I, I still think of myself being 25. I still have, I, I need to get this out of my head, you know? Well, look, that's a good point. And you were, you were still lepping around like a young thing. We saw that uh, nationally televised club matches, a short season. Were you thinking, ah, Jesus, I've retired one season too early? Oh, for the for the county, yeah. for the county setup. Oh, absolutely not. Um, my like what I'm missing most from it is the structure the, in which it gives you. So, geez, we'd be on Thursday here, and I'd be still thinking it's Tuesday. Do you know the structure of training, and they always knew on. You, you, you recover from the weekend, you get yourself right for Tuesday night's training, then you get yourself right for Friday and you do your weights in between. So you always have a structure to your week. What I'm missing is the structure. And I've struggled with the structure since last October. So we got fed in 2019 in the club uh, county final in, in 2019. And since then, I wouldn't say I've lifted too many weights uh, from that point to this point. So uh, no, I, I, I certainly didn't retire uh, a season too early. And the, the prospect of having two... Uh, pre-seasons one after another one now and one in a couple of months time wouldn't be a great appeal to me either <laughs> moving forward so there was no uh, after like it looked like you were definitely enjoying yourself in the in the club there was no chats no kind of casual soundings out from the management or from you to kind of go ah, look sure it's only five weeks I could do that yeah I was lucky enough to play okay in the first half of the uh the club game that was televised. Uh, you didn't see the ones that weren't televised. There wasn't. <laughs> uh, some of them weren't too pretty. But um, no, I, I, honestly, there wasn't. I, I think um, even pre-2019, I remember when James took the job uh, at the end of 2018 and he rang me, I think we were pretty aware that it was going to be my last season, even at that stage. You know? And as the season went on, that, that, that just became more and more evident. My time became less and less um, the influence I was having on the pitch, yes, I was still coming on and doing okay when I was coming on, but the influence I was having on the pitch was becoming less and less as well, and it was time to move on. And I, I suppose bringing it into the Mayo setup then is that we're in a time now of, I wouldn't call it complete transition, but we're in a time now it's, it, it was time for the likes of me to move away because when the likes of James Carr, when the likes of Darren Cohn and these guys are playing, it's important to give them the freedom to actually play. And with me looking over their shoulder, the temptation of always putting the likes of myself on, I think it was time just to move away and give these guys the freedom to kind of to move to better themselves as well. Did, did you get a sense that you were providing a, a positive on that front as well, where they were trying to bring their standards up to the highest level, that even if you weren't starting games, you had that huge role to play in terms of keeping those standards high? Yeah, I, I, I think that has to be really balanced. I, I, like, I know myself as an inside forward, you're, you know, like, you, you, we've all been part of the case. If it's not going well, you take away the car, you take off the corner forward, you know. Um, but it's like to get, I, I do believe people need, you see it in the Premiership all the time, young players need the freedom to know that, like, the Grim Reaper, like myself, isn't looking over their shoulder to, and they'll come on as soon as it's not going well. If you miss your first shot, you know that the, the, the manager might be tempted to put this older player on. So I think there's a balance. Yes, of course, you can uh, use it to make them better themselves and always be improving. But there comes a time, too, where that player just needs to get out of the way, really, and let the young player develop and build and not be afraid to make them mistakes as well. Did, did you take one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with any of the cornerbacks in the Mayo team? Because that's one of the things that Bernard Brogan talks about quite a bit in, in his book, that he'd work a bit with Mick Fitzsimons, and uh, Fitzsimons will say, will you make the run that Andy Moran will make at the weekend? Were you doing something similar? Ah, they, they, there's, there's, there's a guy that I'm in, incredibly indebted to all through the 2015, 16, 17. There's a guy called Keelan Crow. You'd know very little about him, but he, a, a club player from Gary Moore, was part of the squad. I found him exceptionally hard to mark, you know. But I used to run to him uh, any time there was a game on. I used to run to mark him because he was stronger than me. He'd similar sort of pace to me. So I found a really kind of struggle. I, like, I used to really struggle to mark him. And, like, we used to have little discussions during it. And I, I'd be telling him, listen, I'm going to try something different in the game. Don't heed me. Just play your own game and see, see how it goes. So, um, yeah, I'd use him. It's funny that Bernard used Mick Fitzsimons. I'd use 
Keelan as Mick Fitzsimons and then try to kind of work around that to see how we could kind of develop. But um, I did. I only heard part of the interview with Bernard, but um, yeah, that's really interesting to hear that. Like Ger Cafferty, uh, you all know Ger, but Ger is 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 a student of the game. He's a cent like. He'd be in the warm-up area. He'd be marking everything. He'd be marking chairs. He'd be marking poles in the warm-up area. He'd be doing everything. So you have no chat. You have no choice just to go in and talk to him and kind of develop with him as well. So them two guys were a major help to me, kind of all through the years, really, with, with uh, developing my game to mark the best players. All that corporate knowledge that you guys have, do you ever feel like it would be? useful to get into management soon while all that knowledge is still current or do you feel like the best thing to do is to kind of take a little break from that whole environment and maybe sample other environments and have a look around before I look I'm, I'm assuming at some point you want to get into management I don't know that you do but it just seems like as a student of the game and as somebody who thinks deeply about the ebb and flow of matches and who has the experience that you have that at some point it would make sense uh, yeah it's it's like I kind of made no kind of um I haven't dressed it up really. It's it, it's something I want to do. Um, it's something that I want. I, I think you get the sense when you're involved in it, you're either going to be good at it or bad at it. And if, if you're good, you can develop and you keep keep moving. Inside that five to six years, if you go into uh, club coaching or county coaching, you will get the feel for it. If okay, listen, I'm actually quite good at this. I can go and develop it. I can move it on. So that's the kind of point I'm at at the minute. I'm I went in and I coached the under twenties with uh, Mike Solon this year with Mayo. And um, unfortunately, we lost to Galway on penalties. And then I, I coached the Valladolid club team this year as well. So I've already kind of moved into that kind of sphere. Um, I've never kind of uh, shied away from that's what I want to do, and um, I'll kind of keep moving into that into 2021. And like looking at the different types of management and coaching teams that we have ultimately i suspect as as somebody who has shown leadership do you want to be the manager because that's the bit where you get to make the final decisions at the same time the good managers clearly understand coaching and you, you need to be able to build a coaching team that's going to work with the players that you have and in in instill the style of play inflict the style of play if it's required so do you, do, you, do you learn the coaching side of it and get up to a point where you're like, okay, I can have those conversations at a very deep level with individuals and with coaches, at the same time learning the management structures of, you know, obviously everybody's going to be different, but we saw what Jim Gavin did, we've seen what Liam Sheedy's done, we saw what Pat Gilroy did, we, you know, you obviously have intimate knowledge of what, what has happened at Mayo and that has been very successful over the years. So what are you? Are you a coach first and then a manager or are you always being a manager while just getting up to skill, up in the skills with the coaching side of it? No, most certainly um, it's the coaching aspect on on the field that I'm I'm interested in. Um, but I, I think we we've seen a shift. It's it's gone. It's moved from the, I suppose if we steal a um, a comparison to soccer uh, and the most famous one of Alex Ferguson being a manager and Carlos Quiros and all these guys being being the coach. I think that's moved. I think that's shift. I think McGuinness has shifted that. I think Jim Guinness shifted that. If you look at Davy. Davy Fitz in the in the hurling, he shift like it's all shifted towards that. It's head coach nearly. It's 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 the rugby structure, isn't it? Really, it's the head coach, and then you'll have a manager kind of managing all the kind of structures in between. But I think now the way young people are, the way they take in information, the 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 main person needs to be nearly the coach on the field at this at this at this moment. That would be my opinion. Um, of course there's different ways of doing things. It's like business, it's like everything. But that would be my opinion how it's done the the head coach has to be the man on the pitch kind of directing what's what's happening around the training field. Well that makes a lot of sense. And I think the point you're making about young people in particular, everybody wants to be coached. They have a thirst for knowledge and a thirst to get better and it's even maybe that's a shift in, in generations from people kind of resenting oh who are you tell me what to do is actually like tell me how do I get better here? Yeah, it, it, it's gone. Like the, the most exciting thing now about this National League is which team is going to reinvent themselves. I think we're going to see something. I think we're going to see something different. Um, and what team is that going to be? Who's going to be the team that comes out and says, right, OK, this is the way we're going to play. Like what Donegal did, like what Dublin have done, uh, done uh, since Eric Kerry's Tyrone's got to come out with something new and see can they, the other teams go and beat it. So, yeah, young fellas now want information. Where do you want me to play? How do you want me to do it? What kind of freedoms do I have within that within that format? And then they just go out and kind of express themselves the best they can. Andy, I make Kerry slight favourites over Dublin at the moment, given the the retirements and the unavailable players for Dublin, and given that we saw Kerry reach a level last year that they're going to be even better this year because their younger players are a year on, a year stronger. Am I completely ridiculous in that? 
No, I think there's a big, uh, big uh, shift in, in in Kerry. I think the addition of Peter Crowley back into the squad is huge. Um, I don't think it can be underestimated. Now you have uh, you have Sullivan uh, in the back line. You have Foley. Um, you have Ty, Ty Morley. You have Crowley, and the way they run up the field now, that like they, they Kerry were so much different last year. It's, I, I think it's maybe it's slightly hard to explain, but like you have Tom Sullivan coming up scoring one three, one four in a championship from corner back. You know, really driving the full-backs back. You have Morley doing the same thing. You have Foley doing the same thing. And now you had, had Crowley into that mix. You have five fellas or four fellas on a, on a back line who can really drive on, you know, which is huge. Um, it, it, it's huge. So I, I think, yes, I would be excited about to see the way Kerry are. But Dublin, <laughs> I said this during the week, I've written them off so many times. I thought Jared Brennan retires. I think, yeah, okay, he's a, he's the cog, he's the six, he's the he's the man that controls everything. This this sorted out. Rory O'Carroll retires. He's the main fullback. All of a sudden, Johnny Cooper, Mick Fitzsimon step up, and now Joe Bernard does his cruise shit. You think they're in trouble? Jeremy uh, retires. Okay, Owen O'Gara retires. Okay, they're in trouble. But then you go through it, and they have Mannion, Khan, Kilkenny, Scully. Do you know, would Jeremy play? Like, would he start? Do you know, and it's yes, they have a lot of retirements. Um, but you keep McCarthy, you keep Fenton, you keep uh, John you know, the Howard and these guys, and you you keep them fit. Do you know, that team that, that team is a good team, and uh, I still think they're the team to beat. Can, can I ask you about that Connolly retirement, uh, Andy? Because uh, we actually didn't really get a, a Mayo voice uh, to, on to talk about it at the time, when actually the relationship between Mayo and Dermot Connolly is definitely one of the most uh, interesting rivalries we've had in recent times. Uh, how much did you prepare for Dermot Connolly specifically in terms of how you would try and get under his skin before those massive games you had with the Dubs? Yeah, I don't know if you noticed. I didn't really ever get too <laughs> too near to Jeremy Connolly, but uh, I used to stay well up on the side of the field. But um, how did we prepare? Dublin was a funny one because you'd always try to drop somebody in against everybody else. So you'd you drop maybe a ten or a twelve in to make the extra number in the back in case they they come uh, come running through. I think we could compete with Dublin. Unfortunately, we never got over them to win all Ireland, but I think we could compete with Dublin because we had the backs to go one-on-one -on -one with them. And we had two absolute colossus of midfielders for us in Shamey and Tom, Shamey O'Shea and Tom Parsons, who literally could just you know, compete with, not beat, I'm not saying they're better or anything of the sort, but I'm saying if you want two guys who are going to be honest, who are going to defend strongly against two midfielders, they were the guys to do it. And we had them guys to compete with the midfielders, which never created an overlap. Now, also, we'd outstanding uh, backs. I, I suppose if you look at Colin, Colin Boyle, he's four All-Stars. Lee has four All-Stars. And Keith and you've Chris Barrett and you've all these guys thrown in amongst them. You have outstanding backs there as well. So we could actually compete one-on-one. -on -one. Now, the famous battle is Jeremy v. Lee. Um, and Lee kind of gets under your skin anyway. Do you know, he's that sort of competitive character. He makes you so frustrated. You can't get away from him. He doesn't really need to tend to have to foul you because he's so strong and so fast. So the German one was basically, the point I'm trying to get to was was always just a one-on-one -on -one for us. It was never uh, where we had to double up on him because we had someone like Lee Keegan to go and mark him. Now, when Lee got sent off, Stephen Cohen came on and actually did a really good job on him in 2016. But usually you'd put a man-to-man -man marker on him and then he, he, he was okay because you could trust Lee to mark him. The biggest problem you had with Jeremy Connolly, and sorry for drawing it out, but the biggest problem you had was when he used to come on off the bench. And when he used to come on off the bench, that was an issue because now fellas are tiring. Now you probably have to look at your bench and see, right, who we're going to put one-to-one -on, -one on Jeremy Connolly. And if you look at the damage Jeremy has done in All-Ireland Finals, a lot of that against Kerry, against Mayo and against these teams was coming off the bench when you simply probably didn't have the legs to mark him or you probably didn't have someone to come on and mark him. That is really interesting. I, I hadn't actually thought about uh... Dublin using Connolly in that way on purpose as a, a means of setting the opposition off balance with 10, 15, 20 minutes left to go when the game is in the melting pot. The other thing that we really wanted to talk to you about was um, during the week, obviously, the footage emerged from some somebody uh, recording Jim McGuinness training in Galway. And it reminded us of the mad speculation that um, Stephen Rochford had got McGuinness involved in a training session with Mayo. 
how aware were you about those rumours at the time? Did you hear anything about it? Because we'd, we'd DB in studio with us going, geez, that'd be great. And then getting a text live on the air going, I can categorically state they've never had a conversation in their lives. To this day, I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we didn't. We never did. Uh, DB is... Uh... Yeah, yeah, DV. Um, yeah, so it, like, I, I remember that we had a great old laugh about that. Um, I know it was, it was, uh, it was good fun. But like, in fairness to to Rochford at the time, Stephen Rochford at the time, we had a backroom team. We had an amazing backroom team. You had Tony Buckley, uh, the famous coach from Kerry. You had Tony McEntee, Joe Kane, and you had Peter Burke. We had so much knowledge in in the backroom team at the time. We found it quite fascinating that we even attempted to bring someone else in and at, at the time too we'd need Fitzpatrick who was our uh, performance coach which which was great as well um now listen Jim McGuinness is an addition to any team um we all kind of know that like well the guys that are old enough knew that he was in college with Porrick um in Tralee I think I'm not sure they did the full three in a row together but that Tralee team won three Sigersons in a row just before just before my time going to college and they were a terrific team and like the rest, of you, I got the video on WhatsApp, and um, yeah, I thought it was very impressive by Joyce. Um, if I'm being honest, um, for a man of his caliber to have John, well, I, I, I don't know how you would put it. Would you put it the lack of ego or the humility? You know, humility to go and get someone like Jim McGuinness to come down. I think it, it says an awful lot about poor Joyce, um, and I think it's it, it can't be. And negative in any sort of way to have a person of Jim McGuinness qualities there. If he's a performance coach, if he's a coach on the pitch, even if he's just coming in to give you a one day just to freshen it up, Joe, you know, if Jim McGuinness is around the place, Joe, you know, the player's ego kind of says, right, I want to impress this guy, I want to show him what he can do. And of course, it's a, it's a positive to go with. So there was never any involvement with mail. That's it. That's it. No, we're, we're getting the no, truth. No. <laughs> not that I know of. Anyway, I, I never, I never, I've, I've never met Jim uh, in a, in a, off, off a plane pitch, really. Do you know? You know, you never spoken to Jim McGuinness in, in your life, as uh, as David Brady would put it. Maybe, yeah. maybe Brady was maybe Brady, maybe Brady, Brady was onto right. something. I know where I did talk to her or something, but no, I, I don't think <laughs> I have to be honest. Maybe uh, like that. This is the, the exact sort of way a team should have been looking for the last six years. You know, it's like who's the one coach who managed to to, to beat the Dubs in in their recent run? I mean, and for for him to have not been brought in by by any of the, the top tier setups until now is actually, uh, I guess, a little bit surprising. Yeah, I would say it wasn't from lack of effort, though. I'd say an awful lot of teams probably did get a hold of him, but I'd say Jim committed to the soccer side of it, and when you kind of put all like I would say to to go between sports from Gaelic to soccer. I don't think you can have much to, um, you can't get distracted. You can't, uh, I don't think you can have that. Uh, no, I'm talking here, I was my hat really, I'm talking about Jim McGuinness, but in my view, he, 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 I wouldn't say he was he was getting lack of offers. No, I'd say there was offers coming off the table for him, but I'd say it was his decision that, okay, I've committed to the soccer for me to be really excelling at this. I need to put everything I have into making sure I was good good enough to go cross-sport into the soccer world, you know? Yeah, the other thing is, of course, the dubs changed after the template that Donegal used that day to beat them. They changed radically. They they invented a, a, a new position for Keanu Sullivan to play which was uh, not really a six at all, but actually an auxiliary six. And all of a sudden, what Jim had done wouldn't work anymore. You can't just flick the ball on and have runners and uh, score three goals against them and think you're going to win the game. So it, maybe, uh, you know, that, that was... I would say on that, football has changed more in the last five, six, seven years than it had done previous. So I was involved from about 2003 to 2010, Jim comes in in 11, 12, no one knows how to deal with this form of play, it's brilliant, runners coming from everywhere, Frank McGlynn scoring points, even the likes of Eamon McGee and these guys kicking points, Eamon won't like me saying that, but even the likes of Eamon kicking points, and you know, and all of a sudden then in 13, 14 it began to change, they bet Dublin then in, they bet Dublin then in 14, because Dublin were wide open, and then the whole kind of tactical world was Dublin changed just, and then everyone else then had to follow, you know? Yeah, and that's why I was asking you about getting involved, like, now, while you still have all that kind of... You, you know exactly how the teams that you're playing against are going to line up, having literally been in the stands, on the pitch, watching the warm-up, playing against the players in those games as well. So, like, I can, I can, I can see how more players from your era are going to step straight into senior management roles, senior coaching roles, as opposed to the traditional route of maybe waiting 10 years and then coming back into the game? 
Yeah, and the big the big thing about that, depending on what route you go into, is having the skill set to know, okay, I've got an opinion here. Um, this guy is, like, just say you're going in with a management team. This guy, whoever the manager is, has got all these, you know, to, to balance your opinion and to make sure you don't get frustrated as well. So the, their skill sets are known. Yes, of course, you know the players, but then you got to have to be able to work with a team and kind of manage it, manage the management team as well so that your your point isn't being lost and you're not getting frustrated at what's happening as well. So there's a lot of skills that need to need to go into it. But most certainly, I think there's going to be players that will, like you heard, the I heard some of the conversation between um, Kieran and Bernard there the last day, just st stuff that was flashing up on um, social media and some of the knowledge that they were going into. I seen Kieran Donnelly talk about the Dublin Press last year in... Um, in the final when they went down to 14 and bringing clubs out, the, the, the bit on your, I, I, I'm not sure if it was your show, but on News Talk, and it was it was, it was was amazing to see the detail he could go into around what they were doing. And I'm not sure people that, I, I'm not sure people noticed that. I'm not sure people seen the press, like even from him talking, I was learning stuff from it. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's great. It's great to see young people kind of getting involved. Yeah, no, 100%. You can listen to the full podcast on the OTV Sports app, Andy. That's the best sell that anybody's ever done for that. Listen to the whole thing, not just the short clip. <laughs> Yeah, I was supposed to, I was supposed to, I just ran out of time. Ah, good stuff. Great to have you with us, Andy. Thanks a million. Best of luck with the business, and if uh, we can help at all, let us know. Super, thanks lots. Take care. That's Andy Moran giving us some thoughts there this morning. Really fascinating to pick his brain always. OTVM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. And it's a, like, it's a key point about the importance of the fitness industry in communities right around the country. Um, this is not a city uh, thing. This is like, as you can see, it is in small towns where uh, small gyms are giving people a lifeline and a focus and an opportunity to stay fit physically and uh, mentally. Right, uh, quick one here for you. Uh, Every morning this week, we've been giving you the chance to win a brilliant prize with thanks to Expert Electrical as they celebrate the launch of their new website, expert.ie. It's a 200 euro voucher every day for their online store. And uh, our mystery voice today was? I'm a defender who wants to keep the ball out of my net and then build on it from there. But as I said, I'm probably not pretty on the eye, but he's also probably say anyway. Ah, no, that. don't go away from us. That's Shane Duffy there uh, talking himself down. Brendan Loftus from Galway is the winner this morning. Good man yourself, Brendan. We'll be in touch with you on WhatsApp for details on how you can pick up your expert.ie voucher for everybody else. Tune back in tomorrow at 8 and you'll get another chance to win on OTBM. Expert Electrical are Ireland's biggest electrical retailer with 67 stores nationwide. Check out their new website, expert.ie, right now. Noon today on OTB Sports Radio. Leaders' questions with Ronan O'Gara. It's Colm Gooch Cooper at 1. It's a Legends interview with Jim Beglin. A retro panel preparing for the ring with Andy Lee, Sheila O'Flanagan and Anthony Moyles. And OTB goal today is uh, Kev with Quinn, Given and McAteer. It's good stuff on OTB Sports Radio every single day. Get the OTB Sports app. It costs you nothing. You can click on the radio button and all day long you'll have top quality sports radio content in your earballs. We'll see you tomorrow. Best of luck. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters.